I think the market needs conviction that the Fed is really done. This is a Fed that really made a hash of things with the great transitory fiasco, and they can't afford to be wrong again. We've always been in the higher for longer camp. We're normalizing at a healthier level, which is going to help set the foundation for more growth, more earnings, more upside for U.S. equities. At least through the end of the year, we're looking at still a pretty robust economy. 2024 is really the bigger question. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. It is crystal ball season on Wall Street. Live from New York City this morning, good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Browitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market is slightly negative on the S&P 500. We're down by 0.1%. Two weeks of gains on the S&P 500. TK, it's the most wonderful time of the year. It's, it's outlook uh, season on Wall Street. Outlook season on Wall Street out they come with the guesstimates. What's great about the this morning's soiree, Morgan, Stan Morgan Stanley versus Goldman Sachs. Oh, yes. They have the same inflation call plus or minus a tenth of a point. Boy, do they have different views on the spirit, the holiday spirit of the American economy. Ellen Zetton and Morgan Stanley, that was good. Thank you sounded you. interested I for about 20 seconds. Yeah, Keep that up you. for three hours if you can. Yeah, yeah. Morgan Stanley, <laughs> Ellen Zetton are writing the following. Slowing growth, easing policy. Bramo, this jumps off the page. Where they think rates will be, not in 2024, but in 2025. This is the call. Rates go all the way back down to the low twos, Lisa, in 4Q 2025. The distinction between the Morgan Stanley and the Goldman Sachs call is a soft landing versus a no landing. And Morgan Stanley is basically saying a soft landing and the Fed's going to cut a lot more than previously expected. The idea of interest rates going all the way back there underpins their bullish call on duration, their bullish call on U.S. assets. Here's the question. How do we sort of effectuate this kind of pain without seeing an unemployment rate rise above 4.3 percent, something that really has not happened before? Look at the Fed speak this morning, Williams, Jefferson, Bark, Allsby. Do you think they want to go beyond December? Never mind 2025. Think about what we'll be doing I, on Wall Street I think in the coming months, trying to game out two years out. Thursday at 831, maybe they'll want to go beyond. They got to get some key economic data this week. I mean, last week was a snooze fest and this week is not. This is really two sets of data on the American consumer. A tons of economic data this week, CPI retail sales. Bramo will go through the calendar for you in just a moment. I want to turn to a single name in the pre-market. The charm offensive that we could get from China this week could be phenomenal with this meeting between Xi and Biden. Boeing in the pre-market, slightly positive. A story that the team here at Bloomberg are writing up, Bramo, that maybe we could see a sales breakthrough for the 737 MAX aircraft in China when you get this sit down between Leader Xi and Biden. And this could be maybe one of the outreaches from Xi Jinping to the US. What I find fascinating is how different corporate diplomacy is from uh, political diplomacy. And we're seeing that in real cold relief because not only is it China, it's also Riyadh buying Boeing. It's also some of these other areas that have had uh, some real tension yeah. with the US of late, which raises this real question. And you both have mentioned it. That meeting that Xi Jinping is going to have with the CEOs in the United States yeah. might have more interest in import than the meeting with Biden. Absolutely fascinating. And the $52 billion, and I assume that's spread over any number of years, that's 68% of the annual revenue of Boeing, to put it in perspective, what this order means of one year revenue. But what's interesting, John, is Boeing has really struggled within the broader sprawl. Their 10 year per year stock return is a moldy 5% per year. Have you seen that San Francisco has been cleaned up ahead of Xi? I think yeah. cities across America sort of begging the Chinese president <laughs> to make a visit. So they didn't apparently, clean apparently up. what happens is you get the cities cleaned up, crime goes down, TK, it's a wonderful thing. Yeah, well, San Francisco's challenge, we were talking to the chief of the Chamber of Commerce of San Francisco, Edward Ludlow, uh, the other day, and Edward Ludlow said, Contrary to the gloom, there's percolations of straightening out San Francisco. He mentioned a very important uh, local election Interesting. where there was a changing of the guard. And, and Ed Ludlow, folks, the star of Bloomberg Technology, uh, Mr. Ludlow said the, the, the beating up on San Francisco is maybe passing. Is that Ed's promo this morning? That's it. That's Are we it. done? How much yeah. did he pay you for that? You know, 
It's, okay. I, I, get a, I get a case of Anchor Steam, except they nice. went out of business. <laughs> San Francisco, a cleaner city. Let's see if that lasts. Equity futures on the S&P 500, slightly negative here. We're pulling back by 0.1%. The price action looks like this. Yields coming in a couple of basis points. The 10-year right now, Lisa, 462.80. And we're being informed that Ed Ludlow is speaking to the San Francisco mayor later this week. So just to give you a sense for today uh, of why he is coming out with some of this. Eco data this week, as you were mentioning, Tuesday we get CPI, Wednesday we get retail sales and PPI. How much will it matter, right? We were talking last week about the fluctuations in Treasury yields and how these data points could actually set it up for more volatility. Does it even matter based on on the fiscal outlook, and we'll get to that in a second, on the geopolitical front, uh, Xi Jinping set to meet with President Biden on Wednesday in San Francisco. We were just talking about that. And on the domestic front, there's a potential U.S. government shutdown on Friday. And this is why I'm wondering, which data matters the most to the market? Is it going to be the economic data or is it going to be the political data in terms of a potential government shutdown, a potential Moody's downgrade after being revised uh, to a negative outlook? Is that going to matter more for Treasury yields and the risk premium that people are charging? Elisa, thank you for that. We need to talk about the shutdown and the potential downgrade to the US credit rating from Moody's, the outlook chopped to negative. We'll have a big conversation about that a little bit later. Joining us now is Max Kettner, Chief Multi Asset Strategist over at HSBC. Max's outlook season, get the crystal ball, look out to next year, maybe even beyond. Max, you've been constructive for most of this year. You've been right to be for most of this year. Do you think it's a repeat of that for next year as well? Yeah, good morning. Um, I think so. I think it's pretty unlikely, uh, if not virtually impossible, that, uh, you know, big asset managers or the banks are really changing their outlooks dramatically, right? Let's bear in mind, 12 months ago, uh, you know, the, the overwhelming sense was we're going to get a recession in the first half of this year in the US, right? China's going to do better. Europe's going to do better. And then obviously it went the other way around. And, and if anything, we've seen signs of overheating in the US. But what's not changed is sort of cautious near-term outlooks. What's not changed is that people are still rolling sort of their recession forecasts three to six months forward. If you look at earnings forecasts, for example, look, look at consensus earnings forecasts. Uh, S&P earnings are expected to drop by almost $3 from Q3 down to Q4 currently, right? And then by Q1, by, by, in, in the first quarter next year, consensus <laughs> is still saying we're not going to be even where we were six months ago. So that's how low earnings forecasts are. If you look at GDP forecasts, it's the same. It's round about zero mm -hmm. for the next couple of quarters. So we're still faced with this pretty bearish, pretty pessimistic yeah. setup, which continues to allow pretty positive surprises. And that's good for risk assets. Max, you're right. The Goldilocks is back. I get that. But what I love here is you've been right, right, right about this uh, market. We've got outlooks coming up. Ed Yardeni shifts the playing field for the optimists like you today up 22% by the end of next year, SPX 5,400. Can you give that scope and scale to a bull market? Yeah, I don't think it's unthinkable um, because when we look at, let's say, the next sort of six to nine months, again, we've got very <coughs> low near-term earnings forecasts, very low GDP forecasts, and we're probably going to get, you know, core PC inflation below 3% by the second quarter of next year, right? So that's not... It's not miles away. It's not like we're talking about, you know, sometime in 2025. We're talking about in one or two quarters, one and a half quarters. And suddenly, perhaps, you know, real rates, the real fed, federal funds rate is then going to be way, way, way too restrictive. And then the market and the Fed can start talking about rate cuts in earnest. And then, you know, perhaps the curve disinverts. And on the back of that, you're actually going to continue seeing a pretty Goldilocksy environment, right? It's still going to be an environment... I think that's pretty much akin to uh, what we had for most of this year, apart from the scan September and October. So, you know, this is still an environment where I want to be long consumer discretionary, where I want to be long tech stocks, where I want to be long the U.S. in particular. Uh, you know, Max, you want to be long U.S., but is it all boats rising? I mean, are we still going to see the shocking statistics I saw over the weekend of the focus on, let's say, forget about Magnificent Seven, say 20 stocks. Is this about breadth? Or do they just continue to elevate? It's not about breadth. So, Tom, you're, you're entirely right. I think it's a qu or a more a story of even more market concentration and of the big ones winning even more market share, right? Because uh, let's face it, even there, you know, earnings expectations, yes, they've risen, but they're not to levels where, you know, it's, it's absolutely insanely optimistic, right? 
And uh, the, the problem, I guess, is in order for sort of the equal weighted S&P, let alone the Russell 2000, so small caps to outperform, we would need to see a proper, proper reacceleration of growth. But the problem, of course, with a reacceleration of growth, as we've seen in Q3, is that then most likely the long end of the of the yield curve actually starts to jump higher and you know the long end uh, the long end of rates volatility also starts to jump higher and no asset class likes that right because then we're back to the sort of oh is the fed going to do a bit more are they going to do one or two rate hikes more or are they going to stay higher for longer even longer right so the problem is that's that's sort of virtually impossible really right now to have for example things like small caps really really jump on sort of an outperformance train right now to me it's much more a picture of the growth stocks tech stocks consumer discretionary continuing to outperform even in the next sort of six nine months a lot of that smells like 2019 where the fed can sort of really start talking about insurance type of cuts without really a recession and with growth, both on the earnings side, so the bottom up side and the top down, the GDP side, continuing to really defy very, very gloomy expectations. Max, are rate cuts next year going to be good for equities? Oh, yes, 100 percent. OK, 100%, right. Because um, the reason why I ask is because Goldman Sachs has fewer rate cuts than uh, Morgan Stanley. And they also have probably a more positive outlook on risk assets. If the Fed is cutting more, ostensibly, that's in the sign uh, that's in the face of some more significant economic pain. Why are rate cuts still a good thing as they get deeper? Because I think it's, you know, like I said, it's probably pretty comparable to 2019, where we start to realize by the middle of next year, hey, you know what? Core inflation is already below three it might take longer that we're actually going to go down to 2%. And our economists do have a little bit higher core uh, PC inflation forecasts, both for the end of it, uh, next year and, and the end of 2025. But the important uh, point to, to bear in mind is that real rates, right, the real federal funds rate is then going to be so massively restricted that actually the Fed can start talking uh, about rate cuts, right, without a recession, without really us going, you know, to below zero percent GDP growth, it's it's going to be pretty fine if we're going to be b between one and two percent GDP growth. Imagine a world where we are going to see a continuation of the first half of this year, growth sort of one to two percent, slightly above or slightly below consent, uh, slightly below potential, not overheating, no real recession, but inflation you know continuing to trend lower. The Fed starting to talk about rate cuts. The market's starting to price in rate cuts from H2 next year onwards. That's that's really, really good. It's it's as Goldilocks as we can really imagine. Max Kettner says Goldilocks is back. Max, it's good to start the week with you over at HSBC. Thank you, sir. Morgan Stanley, we were talking <clears> about that base case. They have two other cases, the downside and the upside. Do you want to talk about the downside, Bramo? Of course you do. Lagged effects of monetary policy are tighter and a protracted debt deflation cycle in China drags the global economy into recession. This is their downside bearish scenario, so bear with me. To ensure a mild recession, the Fed cuts rates rapidly to south of 2% from the first quarter of 24 to the fourth quarter of 24. That's some pretty aggressive stuff. It sounds a little bit like the Fed put his back. I just want to put that out, that that's sort of a question, because in that scenario, do some people get optimistic, thinking, wait a second, in that case, then you get a bit of a boost to fixed income. <clears throat> then you get a boost to equity valuations and kumbaya. Well, kumbaya, we just put up a great board for radio. It was very clear that of the four attributes we put up, John, the best differential is the job economy. And that's what everybody's been stumbling on through 2023. Maybe we actually finally get a result next year. But that's the key variable is 4.3% for Ellen Zentner. We will stumble forward this morning for some fantastic interviews this hour. John Lieber of Eurasia Group in just a moment. Later on this hour, ahead of the Vegas Grand Prix, Formula One just around the corner this coming weekend, Toto Wolff, team principal and CEO of Mercedes AMG Petronas F1. What a different conversation than Christian Horner on Friday, John. It's been a tough year, hasn't it? A tough, tough year. Did you speak to Sir Lewis Co. over the weekend? I didn't catch up with Sir Lewis. Uh, yeah. We can catch up with Toto about Sir Lewis a little bit later this hour. From New York City this morning, good morning. Are we going to see a government shutdown?
Well, you know, we have the power of the purse uh, and light. We need we need more time. So can Republicans vote together to pass this proposal, this short term funding agreement? We're going to have to. So, you know, I think what the Senate's going to do, they're going to come up with a package probably after Thanksgiving that they will send over to the House. House Foreign Affairs Committee Chair Michael McCall speaking on CPS on the potential for a government shutdown. This following news going into the weekend that Moody's lowered the U.S. credit outlook to negative from stable. House Press Secretary, White House Press Secretary Jean-Claude Pierre saying it's a consequence of congressional <coughs> Republican extremism and dysfunction. That's only partly true. It's also the consequence of successive governments in this country <coughs> doing absolutely nothing about the deficit. Bramo, some of the numbers in this from Moody's sees the federal interest payments relative to revenue and gross domestic product rising to around 26% and 4.5% by 2033, respectively, up from 9.7 and 1.9 in 2022. They are huge, huge differences. This is not just about governance. It's about the debt trajectory of this country. And the inability for governance to deal with that. And even though people are talking peripherally about this issue on the campaign trail, they're not talking about cutting entitlements. That would be a political no-go. And without doing that, it is very difficult to get to the numbers that Moody's, as well as S&P and Fitch, who've already made the move, uh, will actually get behind. Yeah, it's fascinating. And I like how they bring this out. What was that, on Friday at 6 p.m. or whatever? You know, it's <laughs> totally, oh, well, by the way, we're going negative on the United States. Uh, government. I really don't know what to make of it. I have a very clear memory of 2011 and a lot of fancy people saying, so what, to these ratings moves, except they did seem to have a big immediate impact. I don't know this time around. So was it justified? Arguably, yes. And what you're asking is, does it matter? And I think that's an ongoing conversation. And Lisa, it's the same conversation we had back in, what was it, the start of August around Fitch? Honestly, I can't imagine that it's not going to matter, especially given the indigestion that we've seen around some of the bond auctions and the fact that bond auctions have an increasing <coughs> presence and an increasing influence over equity risk, as well as just general market mood. We saw that last week. Moody's is making a rates call. Yep. This is higher for longer. Yep. That's the assumption. The underlying assumption yeah. of Moody's yeah. is get used to it. These are rates we've got to and live with. And ultimately, it's going to get harder to live with here in America. As we go to the politics, tangentially, maybe it's just an assumption by a bunch of fancy ratings people of a higher R start, that it's, you know, monetary policy that will be new, new, new. On fiscal policy and very experienced, our next guest is wonderful. He demanded we have a shutdown clock. We do that here at Bloomberg at Surveillance. We've got clocks for any number of things. Four days, 17 hours, 41 minutes. 53 seconds to shut down. John Lieber knows the shutdown clock well. Over the many decades, he is at Eurasia, Eurasia Group. Uh, John, thanks so much for joining from London uh, this morning. We're riveted to the shutdown clock. What's the likelihood that uh, the nation's going to turn into a pumpkin at midnight on Saturday? Well, it's always exciting in U.S. fiscal policy, and the shutdown clock is fun to watch. But I think fundamentally, both parties are basically aligned around not shutting down the government. So I think that kind of this situation looks like it did a couple of months ago, where you've got Republicans making demands for spending cuts, uh, Democrats <clears throat> saying we don't really want to do that, but neither side really wants to shut down the government. And Republicans are now putting forward this plan to keep funding going through January right. for part of the government, February for the rest. I would bet by the end of this week that's passed because no, unless there's some, you know, some mistake or something goes wrong and these two sides decide they just hate each other too much to actually do this. My, my quick read of the Moody's announcement was it was sort of a statement on civics in America. Are we going to go through a process now and towards the next shutdown six months out, a year out, where we yearn to go back to the system you knew working for McConnell years ago, or are we going to some new system of legislating and appropriations in America? You know, I mean, the, the system is basically the same as it's been for the last decade, where one party or the other is trying to leverage these deadlines to get the fiscal policy they want. And you mentioned with the Moody's downgrade, interest rates and basic civics, but there's also demographics. And the US demographics aren't changing. And because of that, you've got this massive increase in spending as uh, there's more retirees in this country, while tax revenues remain basically flat as a percent of GDP. And what that means is the combination is you get more debt as a share of GDP. We've seen the stock of debt triple over the last 10 years, and that's probably gonna happen again 
uh, in the future. So I think this Moody's rating is, yes, about the short term, about higher interest rates and about the dysfunction in Congress. But fundamentally, this country is on a bad path long term fiscally. Neither party has any seriousness about doing anything about it. Even the Democrats in the what they called an Inflation Reduction Act, which was ostensibly designed to, yes, invest in green technology, but also reduce the deficit, couldn't muster a single thing that's an actual tax increase in there. They had to rely on these so things they could spin as uh, loophole closers. And in the end, that bill is probably going to end up increasing the deficit, too. So there's simply no seriousness in dealing with this problem, and there won't be until there's a crisis. Which raises a question of what it will take. And we were talking with Neil Kashkari last week, and he said he actually questions how much the uh, fiscal concerns about the U.S. really are affecting benchmark rates in the U.S., saying that if this really were an international concern, you would see the dollar weaken. From an international negotiation standpoint, is the fiscal backdrop of the U.S. entering into the discussion more? Is it putting the U.S. in a more difficult situation? In terms of this good with China and other potential trading partners? Yes. Yeah, I mean, I think this is a factor for sure. The U.S. has relied both on kind of, you know, foreign funding of its debt, but also the Federal Reserve as a marginal buyer of debt for uh, this 10-year period of low and dropping interest rates. And that's now shifting fundamentally, where foreign strategies around U.S. debt are going to start affecting the interest rate outlook. And it's not going to be such a sure thing uh, that the U.S. can continue to fund these, these massive deficits. However, all evidence so, so far suggests that when there's a flight to safety, U.S. Treasuries are still the place to be. The U.S. has the reserve currency. And despite all the issuance that we've seen this year, people still think that the U.S. is a pretty safe bet. It's got a deep and rich pool of taxable assets that you can get at in an emergency if you needed to. The big question is not whether or not the U.S. can repay or has the money to repay. It's if there's the political will to keep this going and what it looks like in a crisis where you might need to see an instant incre uh, increase in taxes or something. John, just looking ahead to Wednesday, we are going to get that meeting between Xi Jinping and President Biden. What are you looking for? You know, I, I think this is a very low bar to get over. Uh, the big the big celebration is the fact that they're meeting at all. I think a key question is if they resume the military to military communications that were cut off after the Pelosi visit, this would help de-risk some of the challenges that you're seeing in the South China Sea, where China's, you know, the China argues the U.S. has been aggressively going, encroaching on their territory, the Philippines as well, and they've been sending these warning signs to the U.S. that they, you know, telling them to back off. In, resuming the military to military communications is a step at trying to help de-escalate those tensions. That's probably the most we can hope for. I'm really curious to see what Xi Jinping says in his speech to the American people. And I'm also watching what is his message going to be to U.S. corporate executives who are very worried about a sudden stop in their ability to do business in China. What message does he give them to reassure them that China is still a safe place for them to do business? I think those three things will be the most uh, interesting to watch coming out of this week. That last point is just absolutely huge and a big one for us all week. John, thank you. John Lieber there of Eurasia Group. That final point, Bramo, we keep going back to it. The one data point that matters for this conversation. Foreign direct investment in China has turned negative. That's a problem. This looks like a massive charm offensive. It's just around the corner this week on the West Coast. Although the way that John Lieber framed it, I completely agree with you. The way he framed it seemed to be that U.S. corporations were desperate to get some sense of solidity. So some sense of uh, the fact that the mm. Chinese government isn't going to necessarily interfere with rapidly changing yeah. uh, backdrops of policy. Is that something that they're going to be able to get from an offensive? Maybe there's some bipartisan hysteria here. I thought David Rubenstein of Carlisle and, of course, star of Bloomberg Television was wonderful with Francine Lacroix today, where he just said, look, all of these threats and back and forth by the U.S., is, what he, his word was unrealistic. And so you wonder if some realism is going to show up at this important meeting. I mean, we're, we're at an unrealistic point right now. Okay, great. What's going to be the realism the day after this meeting? I'm with Lisa. We talked about this on Friday. It will be a charm offensive, but what corporate America needs, what it demands, what it wants, is just predictable policy. Is Elon policy. Musk going to be there? Predictable policy. I've got no idea who's <laughs> going to be in that room. We'll see. I'm interested in that, whether the Walt I Disney CEO Tesla's Bob Iger is going to be there. This weekend. I oh, look great. for you and your truck. We could talk about that a little bit later. Futures on the S&P, negative 0.2%. Toto Wolf of Mercedes AMG coming up.
Two weeks of gains on the S&P 500, ending Friday, going into the weekend on a strong Brilliant. note. A bit softer this Monday. We're pulling back by 0.2% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, Tom, we're down a quarter of 1% on Nasdaq futures. You know, you, I came out of the surveillance nap on Friday before the Moody's uh, uh, fiesta, and it was amazing, the bid on the market on Friday, the character of the bid. And Gun into the, the close. Condition into the Nasdaq, and it's like, Okay, the holiday season's starting. You know, I mean, some of us are waiting for after Thanksgiving, but some of us are. The holiday season is starting. It's so much stick for putting my tree up this week. You know, I mean, yeah, let's look at the tree. Oh. Bring the tree right. up on the radio right now. Okay. TK's this tree is let's absolutely be extraordinary. What tree is this? Be, this is the Pharaoh tree. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a blue Christmas for no John. Way. It's way I too early. That looks like a Tiffany's tree. That looks like a Tiffany's tree. Yeah. We say good morning. I went below 59th Street. You went I to Tiffany's this weekend. Seventh Street. What a wonderful new store. Uh, thank you to John and all for having us over uh, there. And this is a huge retail experiment. Okay. They put a gajillion dollars into this thing and with luxury slowing. And John, as you've led when the you way. When you got on, that discount, how many seconds did you promise them? On the uh, I just, just said, so I know. I just said, I said, <laughs> so we Pharaoh's, can count down the countdown clock. Pharaoh's, Pharaoh's <laughs> afterthoughts with us, and she's looking at the ornaments. She goes, These are like the ones John has. Oh, my goodness. You've got tree envy, and you should just admit I, it. You are jealous envy. of okay. my Christmas tree. But Mariah. Okay. But Mariah. Uh, Mariah hasn't gone in the house yet. Okay. 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 <laughs> Maybe you know, one in the house this weekend. That, okay. that, that, if Enough. The, if All we right. get to the bomb Moving market. On. If you the government break. shuts down or not, is the Mariah differential? <laughs> <laughs> Mariah's still going on if the government shuts down or not, okay? <laughs> Yields are lower by a couple of basis points. I can't wait for the stick this morning. We're back to about 463 <laughs> on a 10 year. We're down a single basis point or so on a two year, still north of 5%. What was interesting about last week, we actually had a really strong close in the equity market and just ignored developments in the bond market. So yields were higher on the week for the first time in three weeks. That's exactly what I was looking at, the fact that the bond market was not whipsawing the stock market just simply because the moves were not that significant. And at what point does this go to what Max Kettner has been talking about, where the move index or the implied volatility longer term and 10-year treasury yields will dictate risk appetite as long as there's stability. It's all right for the, uh, for the equity market, regardless of where those yields are. <clears throat> Lots of Fed speak through the next 24 hours. You're going to hear from Williams, Jefferson, Barr, Goolsby, tons more through the week as well. We'll be talking about that. Let's finish on foreign exchange. Lisa's favourite currency pair, because uh. we are <laughs> totally unchanged on the euro at 106.86. 106.86, TK, and going absolutely nowhere. Yeah, very quickly, on a euro yen is what I watched first this morning, and you've got a little bit uh, lesser inflation in one of the measures in Japan, and you've got uh, weaker yen this morning and sort of on the intervention watch. I don't, we don't need a shutdown clock for that. As the week grows older, the week gets more interesting. It's not just about the Fed speak, it's also about the data. Tomorrow, you'll get CPI, as Lisa mentioned a little bit earlier this morning, Wednesday retail sales. I think it's a really important data point. That's some of the price action. Under surveillance this morning, US shutdown risk lingering, despite a new compromise plan by Speaker Mike Johnson. The plan leaving out hardline conservative priorities, like cutting spending and containing migration. Congress has just days to pass a new stopgap bill before funding runs out after November 17th. There's the clock, TK. The House, Bramo, expected to vote on the measure tomorrow. We always ignore this. Every time we mention it, we all groan. We hate talking about it. It happens all the time. Is this time different? And those are like the worst words to say in the financial world. But it feels like, especially with the Moody's warning that we got on Friday, something is shifting where people suddenly are paying more attention and it is factoring in uh, to how the market trades. It does feel like the risk is growing of some sort of disruption in terms of how high yields go, how much people imply uh, an unwillingness to sort of just buy the full faith and credit of the U.S. I push against your gloom, except I think you're right. I think what? there is a change. Who's this? It's I've like got no idea. walking <laughs> down. This was good this week. It's yeah. like walking down the street, and Mary Poppins and Admiral Booms got the weather vane up on top of his house, and the weather vane's turning. I take your point. I think the the, the one trillion interest payment is my starting point. But there's something going on here. It doesn't mean America's about to default. Let's right. Put it that way. <laughs> you almost got to say you. that up front. <laughs> Thank you. It's Thank a you. very different conversation. Thank you. What it could mean is they have to finance these deficits at higher rates. A question we've asked a million times on this program over the last 12 months. Is this country, this government, losing the privilege of acting recklessly? And there's a really important line in the Moody's outlook cut over the weekend. Let's get to some of the quotes from them. I'll share this quote with you first. 
Our expectation is that these higher rates and deficits around 6% of GDP for the next several years and possibly higher means that debt affordability will continue to pressure the US. Embedded in that is an underlying assumption that rates are going to stay higher for longer and that ultimately, in the words of Bill Dudley, by the way, in the last 24 hours, the former New York Fed <coughs> president, it puts this country's fiscal health on an right. unsustainable trajectory. Now, with regards to that line I used a little bit earlier, are we losing the privilege of acting recklessly? Moody's almost addressed that line themselves in the quote. Downside risk to the US fiscal strength have increased and may no longer be fully offset by the sovereign's unique credit strength. Those unique strengths, Tom, they had a unique privilege to act recklessly for a long, long time. Right. You can play roulette with the government shutdown. Right. It didn't matter you buy bonds. That governance right. issue is going to become a much, much bigger issue when you have to finance these deficits at <clears throat> much higher rates in the way that you've had to do over the years so far. Definitive on this is Robert Hormatz, of course, at Goldman Sachs for years in his public service to the nation. And Robert Hormatz would say, if you can't get your fiscal house in order, you can't do foreign policy. And you wonder, with all the foreign policy we have now, are we distracted by this fiscal soup? Two things. Janet Yellen disagrees. She thinks that rates are going right back Shock. down. Stop She's, being so you know, pessimistic about the, pa about the path of, uh, of interest rates. <clears throat> right, that's number one. But number two, what's fascinating to me is that corporations seem to be moving in the opposite direction in the U.S. from the government. The government is looking worse from a credit rating perspective, but corporations in the U.S. are attracting greater and greater investments. And when you look at the look-aheads for 2024, it is such positivity on the United States on all risk assets. So the irony here of seeing the sort of deteriorating outlook for the U.S. government versus what we're seeing in corporate America, to me, is really a stark difference. The balance sheets in America got stronger everywhere with the exception of one place. We had massive fiscal transfers to households in America. Households balance sheets improved, savings went up. We're still talking about that to this very day. A lot of people termed out their debt. I don't know anyone who owned a house back in 2020 and did not remortgage that house. Correct. And has a 2-3% mortgage. Correct. We've got one sitting next to me. <laughs> That's households, corporations, <laughs> extremely low interest rates, record lows. They turned out their debt locked in much, much longer maturities with lower interest rates. The one institution that didn't do that was the United States government, Treasury. Now you can criticize them. Maybe you can make excuses for them. I'm not really interested in that debate this morning. Just as a matter of fact, it didn't happen. And now maybe we've got to deal with some of the consequences, Lisa. What I find interesting is not only are we going to potentially deal with the consequences for the U.S. government, but you're seeing the diplomatic efforts also diverging between Washington and corporate America. It's almost as if they've got two different countries, right? You've got the government and then you've got corporate America, which is a very different diplomatic trajectory when it comes to China, when it comes to the Middle East, when it comes to all around the rest of the world, at the same time that, that Washington uh, is taking a much harder line. It's all mentioned foreign policy, so let's finish on foreign policy. And Israel. Israel's military pressing on with its offensive against Hamas, conducting raids in northern Gaza. President Joe Biden speaking with Qatar's ruler over the weekend in an effort to secure the release of hostages in the Gaza Strip. This is the U.S. conducts airstrikes in eastern Syria on targets linked to Iran. This according to Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin. Tom, not the first time we've seen those strikes in the past couple of weeks. I think we're benumbed by this. I know I was benumbed by it. It is top of, you know, above the fold on every newspaper, on every website, but, you know, you, you've just become numbed at the horror. This week, the focus on a hospital and what is beneath that hospital is being the Yeah, that, that focus continues this morning, TK, yeah, from absolutely. the weekend into this week. Right now, we're going to look at something that Bloomberg's had a real commitment to. John, you know, we're talking about David Cameron, the Lord Cameron. The Lord Johnson has the been Lord very Johnson. good. At, at, at aircraft. Um, I mean, he's in uh, Dubai this morning. He's at the Dubai Air Show, Tom, and Boeing's going to be a big feature of the conversation we have with Guy yep. through the week. If we can get to Boeing in the pre-market and put a couple of stories together, <clears throat> we've been talking about a charm offensive coming from Chinese authorities into this country as foreign direct investment in China turns negative. There are certain U.S. corporations, to Lisa's point, that would like to see more of that charm offensive. That stock, by the way, in the pre-market is up by 3.5%. We're reporting this morning that maybe China's gonna win this so-called freeze with the company, <clears throat> Bramo, and do some more business with Birmingham in a way that it hasn't for a number of years. Which again, raises this question, okay, is this the first foray into diplomacy uh, between China and the US <clears throat> in just in time for APEC, or is this something potentially uh, that is just simply 
a better deal for China, right? That basically they just have two diverging streams of corporate America and Washington, D.C. Yeah, and what's also interesting here is these are big planes that they're ordering. These are not the little ones going between Denver and Jackson Hole or, you know, Denver and Dallas. These are big, big planes from Boeing, the 777s, and I believe there's an add-on 787. And it speaks to where Guy is in, in Dubai. The, Dubai is actually building another ginormous second airport between Dubai and south to Abu Dhabi, at which they hope by 2030 will be the largest airport in the world. Bloomberg News' is Isabel Lee is in Manila, and you got to believe Manila and other Asian people are trying to do a Dubai on the Pacific Rim. I mean, it's a boom desire to be an international hub. Honestly, I'm just interested in uh, the sort of Airbus Boeing tit for tat, and I wonder if the executives kind of are like the West, or West Side Story, you know, like... Oh yeah, this really, when they yeah, walk past each other it's, it's at the uh, air conference. Can you imagine? They, they walk sort of competing. Mm, yeah. mind you. <laughs> exactly. These corporations are at the mercy of their government's relationship with China, and foreign foreign governments as well, yeah. in so many different ways. And I think China is a fantastic example of that. If we just return to what's going to happen this week, you'll have a meeting between G and a meeting between Biden. Then off to the sidelines of this apex summit if you want to call it the sidelines it's always on the sidelines someone wrote an email to me about that in the last week why is it always never at the summit <laughs> yeah, it's always on the no. sidelines it's always the, way. the it's summit. A what happens at the summit it's, it's always a, boring anyway, people speak it's, really it's well. you're gonna Plain have vanilla. is it a dinner between president xi jinping and u.s corporate executives yeah, 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 yeah hundreds u.s corporate executives multinationals and i won't pick on any this morning by name but i think you can sort of imagine which ones i'm talking about right. they want two things one, of course, they want predictable policy coming out of China so they can make really long-term investments. One, without a doubt. And she can try and do something about that. I don't think you get that done in one visit. But two, I also think they want better relations from the US side with China because they want these investments to work. This is where they want to produce things. This is where they've wanted to produce things for a long, long time, Lisa, because that's where the people are that can produce these things at a cost that they've been benefiting from for what? Two decades? Have you ever seen Foxconn? What they actually do? They cannot replicate that in the United States I right now. I feel very strong on this. From both the expertise yeah. as well as just this the worker a, pool and the, the necessity to pay people, they cannot do this. So they want it to continue. And this, to your point, John, it's exactly the problem. They don't want to have to diverge right. from China because it's a massive market. It's the second biggest economy. And yet right. they're sort of frustrated mm. by both sides and the sort of social upheaval with people pushing back and, and different uh, leaders I, trying to I cater to that folks in the next two years this is going to be a third rail thing you can give Bramo credit for this I think this is hypersensitive can we replicate the labor construct day to day that they have in other geographies particularly across Asia this is where people are hoping automation will come into play and that will, that will help with some certain things and again this goes to the whole investment in the US the question is whether we can afford it number one and the question is just you know which companies are going to benefit the most look out for that through the week we'll catch up with Anne Marie in the next down we'll break down some of this <coughs> this hour in about five minutes time we're going to catch up with Toto Wolf of Mercedes AMG Petronas Formula One going into the weekend, Tom. This team was dominant is... for a long, long time. Then a couple of seasons ago, had this heavyweight battle with Red Bull. Red Bull's been on top ever since. It's, there's all sorts of themes here, but John, what's so great here, folks, and thanks to our team for doing this, Christian Horner back to back with Total Wolf. And Wolf is, besides, you know, very much a published uh, a billionaire, he's lectured at Harvard Business School, speaks 14 languages or whatever. This is really the man of Formula One. And he's an, a, you know, a legit racer from the past. And he's got what? The worst engineering team on the platform of the, is it 10 teams? Yeah, I'm not sure I'd go that far. Okay, I'm, <laughs> I'm asking. Would, You're I the pro. I wouldn't go that far. They're just not as dominant as they were a number of years ago, Tom. He's a legit investor as well. I think you've got to have a broader conversation with him yeah. about the business of Formula One. And, and Las also Vegas. the business of sports, too. Yeah. Are you going? I forgot. I'm not. Do you want to make that happen? I, I, I think, I think now we can afford to after Why the... Why don't you check some ticket prices, the I'll airfares? Yeah, OK, I'll get on that. We'll try and figure that out. Lisa Coming up shortly, skin. Toto Wolf of Mercedes AMG Petronas on Formula One going into race weekend in Las Vegas. Equity futures right now, negative 0.2% from New York City. This is Bloomberg. great track i mean it's going to be super fast um there's going to be a lot of overtaking opportunities and the tires it could be like driving on ice 
um, you know, which just adds another dimension. So particularly on a road course, on a street circuit, that can test the drivers and the team to the absolute maximum. Just brilliant to catch up with Christian Horner, the team principal and CEO of Oracle Red Bull Racing, going into race weekend, TK, in Las Vegas this coming weekend. Big conversation about the weather and the temperatures being incredibly low and the difficulty getting the tyres up to optimal temperature. Really front and center, there's been some very good articles on this. 47 degrees is what I see right now is being the temperature. Let's remember, folks, this race is at 1 a.m. New York time, 6 a.m. London time, and I believe that's 10 p.m. Pacific time. They're going to do this at night, which they do at other races, but they don't do it up in the mountain desert of uh, Las Vegas. There's a lot to talk about here, John, as we get to Toto uh, Wolf, team principal, CEO of Mercedes. But John, the real issue here to me, and we're gonna do a little bit more spanner and cis bar. I was reading about the cis bar. Okay. Folks, the side impact bar is very, very important for all these different cars. I look forward and to you flexing your knowledge more, on this. Yeah, thank you. All this right. is more of an engineering <laughs> discussion. Look, I think you're looking at it. Maybe what we've had I hope before. Toto's not running away from the camera. He joins <laughs> us now. Toto Wolf, team principal and CEO of Mercedes AMG Patronus Formula One. Toto, fantastic to catch up with you, sir. Let's just start with this new racetrack. We've spoken to a couple of people about it already. What kind of feedback, Toto, are you getting from the drivers on the simulator going into race weekend? Yeah, first of all, good morning. Good morning to New York. We can also talk uh, side impact structures if you wish, but I think <laughs> you're gonna you're gonna lose some of your uh, some of your uh, audiences. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm skilled at that. <laughs> yeah, we can jump on a separate call. I'll tell you. Um, so the drivers have been in the simulator, and I spoke to Louis last week um, when we had a meeting um, in the factory, and he said the straight is so long um, and impressive, but we don't really know what to expect because, as you mentioned before, we're racing between 10 and 12 uh, local time. Nevada nights, I've heard, can be pretty pretty cold, and the only night racing experience that we have is uh, Singapore and a little bit of the Middle East, but uh, obviously never on a new track. Uh, uh, close to five degrees centigrade uh, with um, Pirelli tires that have never experienced these kind of temperatures. It does raise some questions as to why it's being hosted at this time of the year, at this time of night. Toto, how did that come about? And would you push for a change next season? Well, obviously, uh, Las Vegas stands for entertainment and show, and and Liberty came up with the plan, which is which is great, to be honest. We have not, not raced in Las Vegas for a long time, certainly not in um, modern Formula One, and uh, going there with this new format in the night is going to be spectacular. I think uh, it's been said before, the track is brand new. That means the surface can be quite um, greasy or oily because that's what asphalt do, does when it's new. Uh, we haven't raced in those temperatures, as I said before, but in any case, it's going to be a big spectacle. Uh, I don't know whether we will be sliding around or whether the track is going to be really grippy, but we shall find out in a few days. We've been talking about qualifying and the prospect of maybe needing to do two, three laps to get tyres up to optimal temperature to put in that quickest lap. Toto, any thoughts on that at this point? Um, yeah, we've had it in the past that sometimes you just need to slowly warm up the tyres because if you push them too hard at the beginning, they grain, you know, then they you slide over the surface, the grip is never going to come. So bringing them in, driving them carefully, getting them up to temperature, um, and that could last uh, a few laps, depending, and we're getting a little bit technical here, uh, depending on how much you heat your rims and your brakes beforehand. And teams have various concepts. They either want to have the front tires pretty cool and, and long-lasting, or you heat them a lot, which gives you grip for a, for a single lap for qualifying, but obviously harms them for the race. It could be chaos, or it could be really exciting, to one or the other. It goes to a conversation we've been having all season on this programme, Toto, just how you balance pursuing commercial gains without compromising race quality. What do you make of the current balance of Formula One? I think that we had to, that balance, uh, to cope with that balance for, for a long time, and I think why we love the sport so much is because it's honest. Entertainment follows sport. We're not designing regulations or content because we, we, we want to create scripted content uh, with a certain outcome, with a certain uh, degree of uh, non-variability. We're doing this, we're launching ourselves. There's technical regulations, there's sporting regulations, and then off you go. 
with a certain within a certain framework of uh, cost cap, which is similar to the salary cap uh, in some of the US leagues, everybody has the same starting point. And then we launch ourselves into this. So it's honest. The stopwatch never lies. And, and therefore, the entertainments follow suit. And yet we go through these periods of dominance. We saw it with Ferrari, late 90s, early 2000s. We saw it with you, Mercedes, for a long time as well. And now with Red Bull. Sir Lewis has said recently in the last couple of days, the Red Bull is so far away. I think they're probably going to be very clear for the next couple of years. From your standpoint as team principal, is that a realistic assessment of the future, the next couple of seasons? Well, we're giving it all um, to, to break a cycle. Like you said, we had um, five years of dominance of Ferrari, then we had a short spell of Red Bull, and then it was us um, eight times in a row. And and now it's the second constructor championship for Red Bull or the third driver championship with a indeed very good driver. So we are, you know, with all we have um, in, back in the factory and at the racetrack, we're trying to come up with a car and with, with an execution that is as good as it can be. And we have a next cycle of regulatory mm. change in 2026, but we got to turn this around. Uh. Well, for this race, and, and, and I think Toto Wolf, it's, it's very clear. There's three late races left, Las Vegas, and then back over to the Middle East, Qatar and Abu Dhabi. Are you racing right now for next year? Yes, we have, we have done for quite some while. We're still fighting for the second championship um, in the constructor championship. We, we are uh, second at the moment, and Ferrari behind us, so that, that's an interesting one. Um, but you know, deep down, mm -hmm. second or third, third place doesn't matter. We got to, right. with all humility, fight for the front, and that's why many months ago already we've switched and we transitioned to a new car. Toto, there's a, a phenomenal photo of three Austrians: Niki Lauda, Toto Wolf, and a guy named Schwarzenegger. It's a really, really cool photo. And to take what Arnold Schwarzenegger did and all of our American audience removed from F1 understands the tie in here. When you look at, at, at the showbiz of Formula One, the Netflix success of which you're a star, has Formula One gone to showbiz in 2023? Obviously, you know, there's a few Austrians of us that have gone um, beyond, all, <laughs> beyond the country uh, and Schwarzenegger probably the biggest. And, I was lucky enough uh, to uh, be very close friends with Nicky. We traveled the world around in his function as chairman of the team. And there were very valuable lessons that I that I could learn. Did we get, go be, be beyond the sport, too much entertainment? No, I don't think so. Um, we have, uh, we're trying different formats with the sprint race weekends and all Las Vegas racing in the night. And if it needs calibration to provide a better show whilst staying true to our values of the, the honest sport. I think we've got to try it. But the core product, the Grand Prix on Sunday, within the regulations, financial, technical and sporting is always what Formula One has been uh, all about. Let's finish on the prospect of expansion, Toto. I believe you've been against the expansion of the grid. Do you think it's now ultimately inevitable? I think we, the 10 teams that have been in the sport have been so for a long, long time. Uh, the smaller teams or midfield teams have gone through a lot of hardship a few years ago when COVID struck. Um, but in, in any case, they, they fought for survival. And here we are with the cost cap kicking in. Um, the teams have, most of the teams have turned into profitability and, and finally uh, are in a, a sustainable way in continuing. But that is not a given. You know, we, we are on a high at the moment. And, and therefore, we, we, we've got to respect what the FAA and the commercial rights holder are going to decide whether we, they want to have an additional team joining. And obviously, if we are being asked, we're saying, as long as it's a creative for the show, as long as we provide a better better entertainment, more income, uh, why would any team be against it? But fundamentally, it's um, it's somebody else that decides. And Toto, it's wonderful to catch up with you, sir, going into race weekend. Good luck to you and the team. I'm looking forward to watching the race over the weekend. Thank you for being with us. Toto Wolf there, team principal and CEO of Mercedes-AMG Petronas. F1. Are we going? Are we making this happen? Uh, $1,800 business you look for class. Hotel prices are down, though. We were looking at 5000 Grandma 5, was checking a this. Night. There's, there's a motel cease that, you know, <laughs> on the way to Tehachapi. But, oh, is that you know, what we're like, saying? <laughs> yeah, yeah, just what are the odds the of TK and a motel? A Motel 6. Motel 6. Motel cease. I, yeah. I think I, that that's, um, I'm going to put the uh, over under on yeah. pretty much not happening. I don't think that's happening, TK. <laughs> I don't think that's happening at all. On this equity market in just a moment, Amy Wu Silverman of RBC Capital Markets. And thank you to you all 
for joining us as we cover Formula One TK this season. How they do? Much more still to come. Nailed. Much more still to come. I crashed it. Through the year. <laughs> <laughs>I think the market needs conviction that the Fed is really done. This is a Fed that really made a hash of things with the great transitory fiasco, and they can't afford to be wrong again. We've always been in the higher for longer camp. We're normalizing at a healthier level, which is going to help set the foundation for more growth, more earnings, more upside for U.S. equities. At least through the end of the year, we're looking at still a pretty robust economy. 2024 is really the bigger question. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Let's get your week started. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio. Alongside Tom Keen and Lisa Abramowitz, I'm Jonathan Ferro. Your equity market slightly negative on the S&P 500 after two weeks of gains on the S&P. Squeezed one out last week, TK. It is outlook season on Wall Street to kick off this week. It is. The outlook's change here. We'll get to that in a moment. But huge news flow this week, including CPI and retail sales. It's not the snooze fest last week. It was you wonder how the equity markets... Uh, will react. Ed Yardeni's out front, the bull, and Dr. Yardeni framing out a stunning 5,400 by the end of next year. I believe my Amy Wu Silverman mass says that's up 22%. We'll get to Amy in just a moment, right TK. Yes. I think this is actually an interesting week we've got in store here. Yeah. We've got a lot of Fed speak, some really interesting data points, two really important ones, and I know you'll give us the calendar in just a moment, Lisa. On top of that, you've got this meeting between Xi and Biden just around a corner as well. And you also have, of course, the potential government shutdown. But what I'm looking at right now is this <coughs> divergence, and we've been hearing about this increasingly, between corporate America and Washington, D.C. Right now, Max Kettner was saying that there's a lot of bearishness. I don't see it. In all of the Goldilocks kind of reports that I'm looking at coming out, there's a lot of bullishness about corporate America. There was a lot of bearishness about the political uh, right. sphere, especially <clears throat> given some of the budgetary concerns. It could turn on a dime with the economic reports this week. I'm not predicting that, but it'll be fa I can't fathom the equity markets if the data this week confirms a resilient consumer and a disinflationary trend. If Morgan Stanley's right, if this is the promise, <clears throat> slowing growth and easing policy, I think a lot of people, Bramma, would take that into next year. Just slowing growth, gradual stuff, soft landing, and some nicely easing policy on top of that. I think a lot of people would take it. It's just smooth and lovely and yeah, Goldilocks. It always is but, until it's not. But Goldman Sachs <laughs> takes it a step further, which is disinflation and still uh, raise staying high, but lean into risk because that's going to really do well. Because at the end of the day, we're never going to land. I mean, essentially, it's either a soft landing or no landing, and that's basically the Morgan Stanley uh, versus Goldman Sachs yeah, and the divide. Board here on radio, we got a board up here, Fed funds rate, unemployment rate, change in real GDP, core inflation, and the huge distinction uh, there is the unemployment rate, and that's the same distinction we failed at, I failed at, over the last, what, 14, 15, 18 uh, months. The, the, the labor economy is going to slow. Look, that's the standout note yeah. for me over the last week or so. Jan Hatzius, Goldman Sachs. <clears throat> really constructive into 2024. Disinflationary trends continue, Lisa. There's tailwinds to growth. If growth slows down, the Fed's in a position now where it can support growth. Just all the good stuff, all the good stuff and more, even if things go wrong. So is consensus now bullish? And this is really a key question heading into 2024 because every time we get a consensus, it's been wrong. Is the consensus now either a soft landing or no landing, but either way, things are going to hang in there. And even Morgan Stanley's bearish call of a base case of 4.3% unemployment is not exactly when isn't a warm consensus bullish. <laughs> Coming into this year, consensus was not bullish. People thought that we were going to get a recession. Maybe it would be mild. Well, the economists, sure, but there's always an equity strategist with someone to sell. And they're selling <laughs> stocks, fair. aren't they? That's fair. They That's have fair. something to sell. They do, Tom. I didn't know that. They really. do. We can talk more about that a little bit later. Maybe we'll have a secret chat and a commercial break. Okay. Equity shaping up as follows on the S&P 500. <laughs> Futures look like this, negative by 0.1%, just a little bit softer. Yields a little bit lower, down a couple of basis points. We're down two basis points, Lisa. 463.40 <clears throat> on a U.S. 10-year. Maybe it really is immaculate disinflation. We get that eco data on Tuesday, CPI. On Wednesday, we get retail sales and PPI. Really interesting to see whether demand holds in and we get a disinflationary trend continuing to go down, but I'm looking at inflation expectations five to ten years out and what that means. Yes, Do Tom. we get an auction? Just of T-bills. 
Oh, okay. Today. Do we out. have to keep doing this? No. You can if you let's want. move on. Jesus I actually Lord. really, it's, right it's, it's We're actually free. really cringy. Um, let's talk <laughs> about the geopolitical backdrop. China's Xi Jinping uh, planning to meet with President Biden Wednesday in San Francisco. Are we expecting anything? We don't know. A lot of people are watching the dinner with executives uh, that Biden pushed to be moved after <laughs> his meeting with Xi Jinping. That was one of the big tussles about how to get this thing to actually happen. And on the domestic front, I think this is actually the most underplayed story of the week, the potential for a U.S. government shutdown yes. on Friday. Not because I think that actually uh, it really might matter over the long term, but the reaction in bond markets, in real yields, in when you strip out inflation, what the premium is that people are demanding for U.S. government debt, how much does that respond to uh, more ongoing political dysfunction? I looked up the outlooks for last year looking at 12 months, just so you know. Oh, please. We closed the year 3,800, right? The median outlook was about 4,100, 4,075 on the S&P, so just a touch of upside. Just enough, just a touch of upside. Even though people were looking for recession, yes, exactly. equity strategists were still looking for a touch. So now they're going to go nuts. Of equity upside. We'll see. <clears throat> Let's have that conversation now. Amy was Silverman, head of derivative strategy over at RBC Capital Markets. Amy, good morning. Good morning. Can it continue? It's the only thing that matters right now. Can it continue? What would give you that signal that it can? So I will tell you that it's interesting because we, we definitely get this signal from the options market. You saw If you saw the beginning of the year, we had that low quality rally. If you saw the first half of uh, kind of June, July, when that first NVIDIA earnings came out, the options sentiment tag along the way was also bullish. It was very clear that momentum was wanting to continue. I will say this time around, it is quite stratified. So on the IWM, you are seeing really bullish signals from options, but you're not seeing it across across the board and specifically, you're not seeing it in mega cap tech, right? And we all kind of know if tech goes, the market goes and vice versa. You see it on Microsoft, but you don't see it on Apple. So again, it's very stratified. You're not getting that consensus saying we all have to tag along for the Santa rally. So we're not just at the mercy of the bond market, is what I hear, because it seems to mean different things to different names in the same sector. Yeah, I think people are getting a little bit more idiosyncratic. They've had this earning season to kind of deep dive and look at these names. And of course, you know, when, when we got to that 5%, you know, we are going to trade off of it. But right now you're seeing really different signals in different parts of the market. It's a little bit more factor driven. So it's more value versus growth and it's more mega cap tech versus everything else. That's what's being priced into the derivatives market right now. But just more broadly, is anyone actually expecting the market to go down? No. And, and, you know, the problem with that is there's really, you know, Tom's favorite word, the skew. There's really no skew in this market because, look, last year, S&P drew down 20 percent, Lisa, and buying puts meant you actually drew down 21 percent. It's just failed to work. It's failed to perform. So no one's doing it. It's very boy who cried wolf. And this is this is with, you know, two wars going on. You didn't actually see that tail risk rise at all post October 7th. And to, to some people, that's a little concerning, too. So at this point, would you say that overall people are kind of leaning into the index level? They're looking at trying to get some sort of alpha by just playing different names in some kind of way. But everyone is just basically uh, trying to get in rather than get out. I would say that's a more fair characterization. And the other thing is, look, when you have cash that's yielding 5%, the alternative to hedge is just not as attractive. It's sort of an existential question in our market right now. And when people lean in, it's actually far more to the upside. As I mentioned, IWM, we saw a historic rise last week uh, in IWM call buying. Basically, it hit all-time highs after the move. And those are the kind of things you're seeing, people trying to get leaned right. in to the upside, but not on the downside. So it, you mentioned skew. If you look at the other cross moments and simply the probability distribution, the guesstimate out into 2024, or is it comfortable with derivative signaling active or passive investment? So uh, I will tell you right now, the issue with our market, Tom, is it's become so short duration that I really feel like six to 12 months out because folks also ask have me about the election. Have these options mess things up? Absolutely. How have they yeah. This is really important. Think portfolio insurance, 1987. Yeah. How has the one day parlor game messed up your world? So here's the deal, S&P 500 volumes, you know, just trading in terms of option volumes, 45% is now zero DTE. 
it's massive. So how much has gone shirt duration? And then, you know, I've been doing this for 20 years. People who used to trade one month options, they're trading one week options. Everything's gotten so short duration. So when people say, hey, what, what is the options market pricing six to 12 months out? I say the signal is not great. You can't use it the way you did, you know, five years ago because of this duration shrinkage we're getting. So what are you looking at? Are you just basically avoiding it and looking to the move index? Are you looking to bond market volatility to understand what the potential risk is in stocks? We definitely, we look at move versus VIX. We look at a lot of the cross asset volatilities versus the VIX. And then we also look at vol vol to, to give us signals. They're all very muted right now. The other dynamic that's going on, Lisa, is there's so much volatility selling. There's so much yield enhancement in this market that it's suppressing volatility, even on the equity level. But what we do is we can give a very accurate sense of what's happening one month and under. And the one month and under is telling you most people are still trying to do that upside grab in certain factor levels, but it's not cohesive of across different parts of the market. Just quickly, this volume going through zero day to expiry, do you think it's risky? Do you think it's risky for overall financial markets? Is there a vulnerability associated with that that we need to pay attention to? Because we get a lot of pushback against that. Would you push back against that? I don't think it's as risky as it has been painted out to seem. Um, and, and I will tell you that the SIBO itself has published data. They, they have data that essentially no one else can see that's saying it's pretty well balanced. You know, I would take that at face value. I don't have the data myself. That's what but, Mandy Zhu told us. Yeah, exactly. I know Mandy. And um, what I would say is there, there's this fear of a February 2018, right? There's a fear of a Volmageddon 2.0. The one thing I'd remind folks is that that was a 5% drawdown on the equity markets. It wasn't that big a deal to equity markets. It felt like a big deal at the time. Yeah, felt a big deal to the volatility markets. I'm, I'm sure it yeah. did. Amy, it's good to see you. It's good, good to, to catch you. up. Amy Will Silverman really? there of RBC. It is the most wonderful time of the year. Do you want to sing it, Tom? No. It is the, no, no okay. I don't have it. Steve Outlook Terrell season. doesn't have a three. On Wall Street. That's what this I was all about. I Steve Terrell it's at the, Carlisle the other night. The, the crystal just, ball. The clear, yeah. TK looking out to. It's looking really it's rosy. Looking out to. You know, nice. There's a tint I'm of rose in yeah, there, Yeah, it's just really just you know, glowing. It, it's curing my. You're you embracing that. Yeah, no, the, this is a derivative. It's curing my kurtosis, you know. Embracing that, Bramo. I mean, I, I take it on face value. I wonder about people come out and they say, everyone's so bearish. Well, they got to kind of change that too now because everyone isn't so bearish. So at what point does people start worrying about the bullishness out there? We're not there. But, you know, the idea of consensus being wrong year after year is notable to me. Anybody that lived at 87 is going, what's the odd derivative product right now that's messing up the market? And Amy Silverman was brilliant on this one day short-term option malarkey that's going on. She's fantastic. She's always brilliant. I don't Do you have just that triple us? leverage. Welcome to the program. Your S&P 500 negative here by 0.2%. Yields a little bit lower by a single basis point, 463.99 on the bond market a little bit later this morning. Next hour, actually, we'll catch up with Thomas Kennedy of JP Morgan Private Bank. Looking forward to that conversation. Fixed income, the sloppy bond auction of last week, and the downgrade of the outlook from Moody's on the US credit rating to negative, <clears throat> to negative, Lisa. Does it matter? That's an ongoing conversation. Is it justified? When you go through the justification for it, it's hard to argue against it, isn't it? 100%, which is possibly the reason why you've seen bond yields rise and stay stickier uh, and higher in a longer way. What I find interesting is that it might matter for the bond market. Does it matter for equities? Because it's increasingly equities are getting really sick of bond market volatility. And as much as they look to that, I mean, that was sort of the end of last week was just exhaustion. Yeah. And stock market saying, you know, forget about you guys. You guys just keep bouncing around, figure it out. We're going to go invest in our companies and do our thing. Equities rallying even with a two-year north of 5% again, 5.06 this morning. In just a moment, we'll catch up with Anne-Marie down in Washington, D.C. We'll talk about some of these stories with her. Thank you for the feedback regarding our Formula One coverage. This note came in across the Bloomberg. Do you have a partnership with F1? They get you so many interviews, or is it because London traders aren't watching markets and spend more time on sport? <laughs> Might have something, no. Tom, to do with the latter. <laughs> and not the former. Equities right now, negative 0.2% on the S&P 500. We are pulling back after two weeks of gains. There is tons to look forward to this week. Lots of Fed speak. If that bores you to death, lots of data. CPI just around the corner tomorrow morning, the day after retail sales in America, which I happen to think is actually a really, really important economic data point. After payrolls, after CPI, that's got to be like in there in top three, TK, going into year end. I agree. Retail sales and arguably could it be more important than CPI? And then a big meeting between Biden and Xi on the West Coast in San Francisco, which is looking very clean, very tidy. 
Oh, yeah. Almost as beautiful as New York City. Look at how nice it Good looks. Good morning. When it comes to managing the relationship, ties and communications between our two militaries are critical. The Chinese have basically severed those communication links. President Biden would like to reestablish them, and he will look to this summit as an opportunity to try to advance the ball on that. There is a big get together later this week on the West Coast between Biden and Xi. That was U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan speaking on CNN over the weekend. Live from New York City, welcome to the program. Equities look like this on the S&P 500, pulling back just 0.2 percent. Yields pulling back as well by a couple of basis points. The 10-year 463.40, the euro not doing much at all. Just a bit softer, weaker euro there against the dollar. That currency pair pulling back by 0.09 percent. 106.76, Tom, on the euro against yeah, the dollar. It's going to be interesting. I mean, Amory Horton is going out to San Francisco uh, for these in these meetings. They've cleaned and, it up I mean, for the it, cuisine Tom. there, you know, getting through the, they're cleaning up and, and all that. I've heard you and, can go into CVS and they haven't locked up the toothpaste. Yeah, but she's, just no. for this visit. Just for this visit. <laughs> just for this visit. Wow. But, you know, <laughs> I, I'm joking. I've got no idea. <laughs> Darn it. But that would be a real clean up effort, would, right? That would be if really something actually, That would be, that is how you judge any city. When you go into CVS, is the toothpaste locked up or not? <laughs> That's how you judge a city in America right now. Tom. That is. We're not doing that in the United Kingdom. But I would say in San Francisco, it's about the food. And Anne Marie's going to be at Saigon Sandwich or Volcano Curry. And, you know, I think it's a real opportunity for the president to do a walkabout with Mr. Xi and, you know, see the cuisine of San Francisco and get it done right. It is so sad that I was really genuinely excited. excited. Things are so maybe, much better. That, that Crimes drop so much. <laughs> that maybe we wouldn't have to lock up toothpaste and deodorant. That, to me, is one of the biggest barriers and frustrations when you realize I you don't have something. You doubt. go in and you have to push a button and then wait for someone to come and unlock it, and then you feel vaguely it's, guilty picking something out and judged. To be fair, every country does this. Whenever you get a big foreign leader coming in, have you heard where the location will be for the G7 in Italy next summer? Oh, no, just that we're going to be there. The cruise Puglia. ship you got is just great. Middle of June, yeah. Borgo Ignazia. Okay, beautiful hotel, uh -huh. luxury resort. Giorgia Maloney, I was almost upset with her, the Italian prime minister, because I think there are certain areas of Puglia in the south of Italy that are really, really deprived and could use a lot of attention and a lot of money and a lot of investment. Go to that place. Help people invest in there. Get some business, some tourism going there in the middle of June. Go to the most luxurious hotel <clears throat> on the Adriatic coast, Itike in Puglia. I, I, I think that's a missed opportunity. Mm -hmm. I really do. That hotel will be sold out in June regardless of whether the delegates and the officials and statesmen and leaders from all over the place go or not. And does anything get done and will there be a statement out of this meeting in San Francisco? So in some ways it's nice they go to San Francisco and actually clean up the city. <clears> because it <laughs> Let's see how long it lasts. My God. It and and, and, and okay. Anne-Marie's staff just emails in and goes, Anne-Marie's got a reservation at Lou's Cafe in San Francisco. Joining us now are Bloomberg San Francisco restaurant correspondent Anne-Marie uh, <laughs> Horden. It's not going to be lots of delicacies in San Francisco food. There's going to be serious conversation of these two presidents. What will be the lead item, Anne-Marie? Well, Jake Sullivan said over the weekend the highest priority really for the president has been to reestablish those military to military connections. Remember, we have not had a Lloyd Austin sitting down with his counterpart. There was a Chinese counterpart for the head of the defense, uh, although he abruptly was removed from his post. We're still waiting for the next name. But Lloyd Austin has been trying to sit down with a defense leader from the Chinese government, and they've uh, shrugged him off every single time. And this comes back to when Speaker Pelosi went to Taiwan last summer. So for the president, this does seem to be one of the highest priorities, getting back the military to military communications. Um, next on the list is going to be a slew of items. Iran will be discussed. What is going on in the Middle East? Obviously, the other power struggle in the world, right. Russia's invasion of Ukraine. In both <clears throat> these conflicts, the United States and China are on opposite ends. Then things like fentanyl coming into the United States. What is happening when it comes to their economic relationship? I mean, there's a number of items for these right. two individuals to discuss, and they haven't sat down since the G20 in Bali. So it's an important meeting. What's, what's wonderful about this, Anne-Marie, is the president, assuming leaving, you know, he'll be on United coming back to Dulles, uh, you know, uh, Thursday morning. He gets back for a shutdown. What is the likelihood the president will fly back to Washington to shut down America? Well, Terry Haynes of Pangea Policy says that it's a 30 percent likelihood now of a shutdown. 
What you're seeing from the House Speaker over the weekend is this laddered approach or two-step approach. Some parts of the government will be funded till January, the, and other parts will be funded till February. That's a nod to some members in his party to say, look, I'm not doing a full carte blanche, uh, clean continuing resolution. I'm doing it in two approaches to give some uh, impetus and some pressure to get these appropriation bills done. The, the, the fact of the matter is, though, it is a clean continuing resolution. He's keeping the government open just in different tranches. So that's drawn a lot of ear from some very right members of his party, notably Chip Roy, a number of individuals who are saying this is not what we want to see. And it's also drawing ear from the White House, who is annoyed about this two-step approach and also the fact that this continuing resolution does not contain the supplemental request the president has asked for Israel, Ukraine, Taiwan, and the southern border. But the fact of the matter is we have not seen the Democratic leadership in the co in Congress come out and tell Democrats how they should vote. So likely this has a path to passing in the House of Representatives. It's, it doesn't have a poison pill, so it'll be hard for some Democrats to vote against this. And, uh, yeah, he's going to lose some hard right members, but I think most moderate and centrist Republicans who want to keep the government open will. The fact of the matter is, though, this is how Speaker McCarthy lost his job. Yeah, and that's definitely hanging over uh, current Speaker Johnson. I'm just wondering, in San Francisco, which will be very clean, we were just talking about that, is there going to be animosity between President Biden and some of the corporations in the United States that are having their own dinner with Xi Jinping, and they're very much different kinds of approach to diplomacy? Well, I think the White House understands that America Inc.'s CEO is going to be the most important meeting for Xi Jinping. Um, but Xi Jinping is making this visit to San Francisco, to California. On the sidelines of APAC is the CEO's APAC meeting. So, of course, she's going to want to sit down with chief executives. Sometimes what I think gets lost in mainstream U.S. media is uh, how fragile China's economic recovery has been since the pandemic. Look at the property market. Look at youth unemployment. This summer, it was 20 percent until they stopped uh, putting out the data. So Xi Jinping has some domestic issues he needs to deal with at home. And he wants to make sure that when you see what's going on between export controls and penalties and sanctions taking place via the United States on China, he wants to really bring in some more investment. And that is why he needs to sit down with chief executive officers. But obviously, the most important meeting will be with President Biden, because this will be a higher level, not just when it comes to the bedrock of relationship of economics, but a number of other issues as well. Just quickly here, Anne Marie, how, bar, how low is the bar right now for anything to come of this meeting? I mean, that's basically what everyone's been telling us. Well, I think the bar is the fact that these two individuals are meeting and sitting down is happening and that bar will be cleared. And, and that's really what it was. The fact that they're meeting is a sigh of relief, honestly, for a lot of world leaders around the globe that do not want to see a tit for tat continuing fighting between Beijing and Washington. And they don't want to see this bifurcated economic system where they either have to side with the United States or side with China. So world leaders are breathing a sigh of relief that these two individuals are sitting down potentially if they get the military to military communications um, back up and running in, in a normal cadence, that will be another win. But you're right, Lisa, the bar is very low. AMH, thank you. Dan in Washington on the meeting, big meeting coming up a little bit later this week between Xi and Biden. No <clears throat> deliverables expected here, Bramo, so to speak. It's the jargon, isn't it? Deliverables. That's good. It's like take it, it sets off. the stage for maybe some further down the road, though. You have to start with a conversation, and this is the conversation we begin with. And it's the first one since the whole drone getting shot down, the balloon fiasco and what happened yeah. with Tony Blinken and then the potential slights at the table with President uh, with, with Xi Jinping uh, and, and the potential risk there of the tip for tat rising. I do want to know first of all, whether they're going to lock up the, the uh, toothpaste, but then more importantly, what the corporations come out of it with, because they actually could come out with some deliverables, including Boeing jets. Well, yeah, well, I mean, the Boeing is a big $52 billion deliverable, uh, uh, which, which, is, which is great. But the, the, to me, the major deliverable here is just the pomp and circumstance of it. Ed Ludlow, thanks for watching this morning in San Francisco, Ed. And he says, He's awake. good mong kuk is where you get your best deliverable Chinese dim sum. That's thank you, Ed Ludlow, for that wisdom. Chinese takeout in okay. San Francisco. All right. It's good.
Good. All right. You're not at the Four Seasons. Okay. Yeah. Honestly, the stuff they'll banner for you. <laughs> Honestly. That little old nail okay. All right. Just nailed that. Welcome to the program. Your equity market looks a little something like this across the S&P 500 and the Nasdaq. On the S&P, we're pulling back just a quarter of 1% on the S&P 500. Nasdaq futures down by 0.27% over the previous two weeks on the S&P 500. Two weeks of gains with a really strong finish to last week, even with this picture in the bond market, a two-year back north of 5%. Your bond market right now, two-year, 10-year, 30-year looks like this. Yields come in a couple of basis points. Tom, the two-year still 5.0454% <clears> on a two-year yield. The 10-year this morning down a couple of basis points. That's, Let's call it 463. I'm glad you caught that, John. I missed that. We're at a 505 on the two-year yield, and that's part of the enthusiasm Friday. And still had a you strong know. finish in the equity market yeah, even I with that, that move. Very good. Should we look at the 30-year together, just after the sloppy bond auction There's we had auction, yeah. last Grandma week? The 30-year at the moment shaping up as follows. Your yield was through 5%. It's back down to 475 and down another basis point, Lisa, this morning. My favorite part of this is that this counts as not volatile. The fact that we didn't go up and down 50 basis points and only 25 basis points is actually a victory. And suddenly this is being viewed at as stability that you can bank on, at least in the equity market. Do you think it the market? I what the, the, the equity market did this auction and then on the from auction that, did the stock market? but i think that what we have gotten and with all of our crystal balls that look beautiful what we've gotten is it's gorgeous i think the people are are looking at the unlikelihood that rates are going to go up much higher from where we are and unlikelihood that we're going to get 10-year yields to six percent like some people are projecting earlier in the year so this is what stan chart and eric robertson were talking about over the weekend you can make the call maybe dollars pete yields have peaked. Mm -hmm. Can you make the call that we're going a lot lower from where we are? Or are we going to consolidate? George Bory, I think, over at Wales, thinking we consolidate around these kind of levels. It's a great question. And that's what I found most interesting about Morgan, St uh, Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs. They agreed on a lot. They totally disagree on where rates go, whether it's going to be 3.175 percent or whatever, the, uh, the, the two points, I mean, whatever. <laughs> it's right. or the, this is or great, Bramma. Well memorized. Have some more dim sum. <laughs> Four and a half but percent. It's Monday. It's been a long to week. Get to, they, it. They, to get to that yield call, they to get to that yield call, they disagree on the unemployment rate. To me, that's the key distinction. Yeah. Of those Jan Hatsius is way Zen more Zen constructive on that stuff. Yeah, yeah sure. Well, Under surveillance this morning, let's get to it. The Israeli military pressing on with its offensive against Hamas, conducting raids in northern Gaza on the outskirts of the third largest refugee camp in the enclave. Senior Israeli and U.S. officials suggesting that talks on securing the release of some 240 Hamas held hostages are intensifying, while least the U.S. conducts airstrikes in eastern Syria on targets linked to Iran over the weekend. I've been reading obsessively about this, and the more I read, the less I know. I don't understand exactly what the conversations look like. The meeting in Riyadh with the Iranian uh, head alongside the Saudi Arabia heads, this is unheard of in the past decade, right? We're looking at all sorts of new kinds of diplomacy, but I'm not really getting a clear read other than what you would expect in terms of some of the readouts. Right. So again, it's just the lack of knowledge with a lot of misinformation piled in. And what, what I want to know from Ethan Bronner and our Tel Aviv team is how is Mr. Netanyahu doing? There was a little, not a little, there was a great confusion over the weekend over one nation at war versus the domestic politics that, that the prime minister faces. Under you know? pressure domestically, Tom. Yeah. I, I, Without I, a to doubt. me, a real mystery into this week to see how Netanyahu gets to uh, November, for that matter, gets to December. Speaking Politics. of this week, looking ahead to a phenomenally <clears throat> busy week, US CPI data due tomorrow, along with earnings from Home Depot. Big week for retailers and retail sales as well, which come on Wednesday, by the way, alongside US PPI data. You get earnings from Target then. Then all eyes turn to President Biden's scheduled meeting with China's Xi Jinping at the APEC summit in San Francisco. On Thursday, more retailers, Walmart, Macy's and Gap, and Friday night at midnight, in co his Congress's deadline, Lisa, to pass a funding bill in order to avoid a U.S. government shutdown. We mentioned this in the last hour. This week, there's a lot on this schedule, on the calendar for this week. And it's a fantastic litmus test for exactly what's moving the market the most. Is it the benchmark economy? Is it rates? 
Is it the fiscal backdrop in Washington, D.C., or is it earnings that continue to be pretty robust with retail sales and the consumer driving it all? It's an incredible yeah. litmus test across a slew of indicators. Claudia Sam, never more in the news right now with discussions of recession and that, and she's been brilliant on pushing against that. And the basic idea here is what is the character of the American service sector economy? I'm going to guess we don't know. With all this technology going on, the haves here, the people going to Las Vegas to see Toto Wolf's team, all those people are prospering, prospering, prospering. Half of America's flat on their back in the meantime. Claudia Sam, 8.30 Eastern time. I believe yeah. she joins us in about an hour. Lisa insisted, here it is, the outlook from economists of Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs diverging on their forecast for the Federal Reserve. Morgan Stanley projecting the Fed to make deep rate cuts okay, over the next two years as inflation cools. You can run us through the numbers, Brad. <clears throat> While Goldman keeping much more in line with the Fed's own forecast, which showed two quarter points cuts penciled in for next year. In the report, Morgan Stanley's Ellen Zen, a good friend of this program, saying, quote, we maintain our view that the Fed will achieve a soft landing, but weakening growth will keep recession fears alive, Lisa, going into next year. 2.375 uh, was their forecast. Nice. <laughs> time, I'm really glad I remembered that. But interesting to see the divergence between uh, where they think rates go versus the Fed funds rate versus uh, Goldman Sachs. The interesting thing is when are Fed rate cuts a bad thing? When are they a good thing? And this, to me, is really going to be one of the key questions well, next year. Is it just sort of cosmetic cuts to sort of make it look nice uh, based on the slowing economy? Or is sure. this going to be a deep, profound cutting I, pace, which is what TD I'll Securities came out make with? make it super, super simple. Please there do. are some people on the street, Tom, who just want rate cuts, and it doesn't matter why they're cutting. I would sit here and say not all cuts are created equally. If it's because of a supply-side response, <clears> good news. If it's because demand has deteriorated to such an extent that you've got to cut interest rates, less good news. Pick your poison. The, the poison I'm going to pick is with certitude they're going to do it after the fact. They're going to be late to cut rates. They're by definition ex post. And then the series of rate cuts, if you believe in that, comes from the news flow and that immense pressure of being late by definition and then having to catch up. And I, I think mean, they want to be late, Tom. To your point, they want to be late this time because they, they want, want to be, be sure. Can't they want say to be it absolutely enough. sure that inflation right. is going back to target, based yeah. on what we heard from Neil Kashkari right. last week. And, and wildly asymmetric discussion will be much for our Fed coverage. Here. Look for the Fed decides in the coming months uh, here on Bloomberg Surveillance. Sonia Martin now on FX on monetary policy, head of DZ Bank in Frankfurt, Germany. Sonia, thank you so much for joining. I love, love, love. I'm going to do this briefly because I know there's a million things going on in FX. But in Japan, with an ever weaker yen, you go out to pips, which folks conventionally is four decimal points out. It's not Gladys Knight in the pips. It's every pip. And we're moving every pip higher on a weaker Japanese yen. What does, what does that mean for those institutions in Japan? What's their level of panic at, say, 7 p.m. U.S. time? <laughs> I would say the level of panic is probably pretty high, but it's a difficult situation because, as you know, the, uh, it's the Ministry of Finance that decides on FX intervention, not the Bank of Japan. The BOJ is merely the one executing intervention. And we had a situation last September, if you remember, where the MOF decided to intervene to stabilize the yen, but the BOJ remained really <clears throat> expansionary in terms of their monetary policy. And this is the problem they still have, right? I mean, the MOF is undoubtedly unhappy with the weakness of the currency. And, you know, with every pip that we move higher in dollar yen, this problem worsens. But at the same time, we still have the BOJ sticking to its ultra expansionary policy and still, you know, giving some very dovish tones. So it's tricky to intervene and there's a high right. risk of failure. I look at secondary pairs here like Australia as compared to Japanese yen. Which secondary pair do you study to get insight into weaker Japanese yen? I think, to be honest, it really is mainly for us uh, a question of looking at dollar yen and euro yen. I mean, obviously, if you look across the board, you will see the weakness of the yen, uh, you know, uh, widespread. It's widespread. You could look at the trade weighted index to get a bit more of a feel mm -hmm. of how that's affecting the economy. But ultimately, I think, you know, trying to pick a level is always difficult because the BOJ and the MOF have in the past tried to avoid you know, sort of creating this line in the sand that they could then be beholden to. Um, so this is why, obviously, they didn't intervene at 145. Um, so they've sat it out a bit longer. But with every day that passes, the pressure mounts.
Sonia, a lot of what Japan is watching is the same thing that everyone on Wall Street is watching, which is the Fed, and what the threshold is to cut rates, mm. which could give them a pass to move away from yield curve control. Do you think that it's overly ambitious to view all Fed rate cuts next year as a good thing for risk assets? Not necessarily. I think, you know, when you look at why the Fed is going to be cutting rates, I think you just discussed it before it came on the show. Um, I mean, we're looking at a situation where growth is going to slow down, we believe, but it's not going to be, you know, we're not talking about a recession anymore. We're talking about a very soft landing. Uh, and what's going to happen is as inflation declines, you know, real rates will rise. And this means the Fed has scope to cut rates. So I would very much view it as the Fed having that opportunity to cut rates. This is not, I think, a situation in which rates are being cut in response to very weak growth. So I don't think that rate cuts are necessarily negative for the market as a whole. We've been talking about the different outlooks for 2024 coming out. We already spoke about Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs. TD Securities came out with this uh, today, basically saying that they expect a uh, more rapid pace of rate cuts than markets do starting from mid next year. Do you agree with that? Um, we also have the Fed cutting rates as of the middle of next year. The particular problem that we're going to have next year is, of course, that the Fed will have a certain window to cut rates and then the election is going to come. Um, and they can't cut right before the election. So our best guess is they're going to start cutting in the summer, pre-election, you know, hot point, and then have to wait until after the election. So we're probably looking at three rate cuts next year. Uh, I don't know what the current consensus is, but it's probably in that vicinity, I'm guessing. Sonia Martin, thanks for the update. Appreciate the outlook of DZ Bank looking ahead <clears> to 2024. We're calling these guesses, Tom, best guesses, guesstimates. Crystal ball type uh, stuff. After this next year, year, after the last 18 months, and 5% GDP a growth. Do you and remember in the third I mean, quarter? Uh, you, <laughs> I don't session. know if you guys remember this, but it used to be return, routine, rather, to have a three year view and to have sensitivity analysis boxes with moving parts to it to show your certitude going out two years or three years on what if basis. I haven't seen a report like that in ages. I want to see a box that's just basically a dartboard. <laughs> it's sort of, you know, you can interactive uh, kind of uh, forecast. You can throw your own dart. I mean, honestly, it's been <clears throat> a humbling experience for everybody. And oh, nobody really understands the paradigm that we're moving into. Lisa, we got some scenario analysis from Morgan Stanley, which, Tom, I think is what you're speaking to. You have a base case. You have a bull case and a bear case. This is the upshot, the upside from Morgan Stanley. This year's strength in consumption and investment extended to 24. GDP increases by a similar 2.5% for Q4Q. Payroll growth remains strong. And the unemployment rate continues to fall, reaching a low of 3.4%. Strong demand wow. and inflation pressures force the Fed to hike an additional 100 basis points in 2024. That's not their base case. But at least recognizing there is an upside potential here, Bramo, that this continues. If the labor market holds in, that a lot can happen that's very positive. If it does not, a lot can happen. I'm thinking housing that's very much not. I don't, well, let's, let's do this, John. Let's do it some data here. And I, I've got, a, I think, a really important you insight. You've got things to say. For, yeah, I've got a Dan Ives insight. <laughs> Is this Seriously. a tease? No, Dan Ives insight. OK, a tease. Yeah, you know. can call it a tease. Yeah, it's a tease. OK, I'll go through some numbers. When, and Ives is dressed like that. Let the suspense build, the, so yeah. to speak. Right. If you're just joining us, something big is about to come from Tom, apparently. <laughs> Equity futures <laughs> negative by 0.2%. Yield to lower by a basis point, 10 year 463. Drum roll, do you want a drum roll? I don't need a drum roll, you know, thank what's, you. What's that? Okay, the great. drum rolls. <laughs> Give us the you, insight. You ever notice that Ives dresses better on CNBC than he does here? He shows <laughs> Is that up your here, insight? He shows up That's here like Lily Pulitzer. <laughs> was, this, was this what we were waiting for, Tom? No, I'm, I'm looking at this insight, which you can only get from the Bloomberg, 2.7 trillion market cap on Microsoft. Do we need to begin next year and the following year to begin to seriously gauge $4 trillion and $5 trillion market caps on some of these select magnificent seven? I don't think anyone's prepared for that, including a wise guy Super Bowl like Dan Ives. So you've touched on something I think far more important. We've yeah. talked about things we got wrong this year. It wasn't just where the economy would go. It was where rates would be and where tech would be at the same time. Yeah. Microsoft's up 54% here exactly. today. Exactly. Thank you. That's a better statistic. You, it's you, up you, as usual, 54% outshone What's me. What's that? 150 something? Yeah, more than that, I think, yeah. yeah. And Nuts. then the likes of NVIDIA and, yeah, just in their own world. Total it's bonkers. Been amazing. In the next hour, 8.30, Claudia Sam, former Fed economist, is going to join us to talk about this labor market and what it could mean for Fed policy from New York City. Good morning.
this is a Fed that really made a hash of things with the great transitory uh, fiasco, and they can't afford to be wrong again, you know, in the same cycle, in the same direction. That would look like they didn't learn from the first time around. Every couple of weeks, they're going to keep reminding us until they stop that uh, you know the inflation might come back and that they can't yet be sure and that yeah we'll hike again if we have to that was ian shepherdson chief economist of pantheon macroeconomics who thinks the fed probably will cut rates next year but they're just not going to talk about it yet which is the tedious conversation we seem to be having every single day right now on this program welcome it's monday equity futures look like this on the s p keep it together bramo <laughs> futures negative two tenths of one percent on the s p yields are lower by a couple of basis points 463.40 tons <clears throat> to look forward to this week should we go through the week ahead again yeah because it's actually a phenomenal week ahead right big week you've got this meeting between biden and, and G, we can spend some time talking about that. But also, you've got CPI tomorrow, retail sales on Wednesday. In between, you've got PPI. You get some Home Depot earnings. You'll get numbers as well from Walmart, Macy's, and Gap. And then on Friday, you've got this deadline for a government shutdown. I think one of those would be enough, Lisa, but you're getting it all at once <clears throat> this week. It's a bonanza of potential bonanza. Uh, instigators for market moves. And here's the question for me. What's going to be the biggest thing? Is it going to be fiscal? Is it going to be corporate? Or is it going to be monetary? And that's sort of you know, the, the economy. Is it going to be companies? Or is it going to be well, also, the dysfunction in Washington, D.C. that gets the most attention? We haven't even touched on this. We're going to go British here in a moment, so let's do it. The I Lord Cameron, <laughs> the Lord Cameron is back in office. <laughs> As foreign secretary. Yeah. Is, is, and it was, it Which goes is kind back of one of those statesman-like roles that perhaps he'll enjoy. What do you think? I mean, I mean he was... I, don't think I, I, I clearly remember. There. John had put in an 18-hour day. I was sitting in Browns yeah. in Mayfair. And I'm watching the TV, and there's John doing it. And Cameron comes out, and like, John, in 32 seconds, he resigns. He says, I got it wrong. I got Brexit wrong. Goodbye. It's kind of bizarre. I mean, one of the biggest international events that's taken place for the United Kingdom in the last decade was Brexit. This was a man who was against it, <clears throat> lost the referendum, resigned as prime minister, and now he's back in the... In the government, Tom, which is a bit of a turnaround, isn't it's, it? It's good. Just in I, I terms of being a statesman, though, respect on the international stage, I think you can make the argument he's still got it, can't you? And Rishi Sunak, I the prime minister, who's honest. under tons of pressure. They're 20 points behind. In, yeah, the, in could, America, that's like huge. Could probably use some stability. Yeah. There's whether, your British politician. Whether David Cameron is your man for stability, I guess, is open to debate because <clears> there will be people on either side of that conversation. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance. Lisa Bramowitz, Tom Keenan, the Lord Pharaoh. Right now, we're going to go to Queen Victoria Street, just near Mansion House in London, our senior executive editor for energy and commodities. Will Kennedy, Grant Smith writing it up today. OPEC argues against excessively negative sentiment on oil. Since the October low in the stock market in America, Brent crude's down 17%. How much is oil, this negative sentiment, how much is it playing into the guesstimates forward? Well, I think what you can say is that OPEC makes some reasonable points when it comes to the demand side of the picture. The demand does appear to be reasonably robust, that most of the oil traders that we speak to see strong demand this year from China, from Asia. They see that continuing to next year, despite concerns about the slowdown in the in the Chinese economy. And it's clear from the official selling prices that Saudi Arabia is confident in its selling its Asia, oil to Asia. So I think on that side of the equation, OPEC's probably on solid ground. Where perhaps they're on less solid ground is that supply also appears strong. You've got new oil coming on from South America, Guyana and Brazil. You've got a shale patch in the US that isn't growing as strongly as it uh, once did, but it's probably growing strongly. Right. It's more strongly than people expected. And you've got Russian exports, which are looking quite lively again. And you put all that together right. and the balances probably aren't that bad. Uh, you know, there's a lot of oil about. Will, I'm fascinated. Maybe it's an unfair question to you, but you're so good at this, I'm going to try it. What's the perfect oil price for China? What's the perfect, the optimal oil price for Xi as he travels to meet with Biden in San Francisco? Well, I don't think um, uh, China typically minds oil being too low. It does have a bit of a domestic industry, but it's not on, the, on a par with um, the US, for example. I think that the Chinese get uncomfortable with $100 oil. They can probably live with oil as it is now. They wouldn't want to see it higher. I think for consumers today, 70 to 90 is okay. Anything above 90, 
probably makes them a, bit, a little bit more anxious about, about inflation. But, Will, haven't they been stockpiling crude, cheap crude from Iran, from Russia for the past year? Don't they have massive stockpiles that actually will mean that they won't actually have to buy all that much next year? Well, we do think that they have uh, been adding to their stockpiles, both uh, privately and, and state inventories. But this is a this is a, the world's biggest um, importer of oil and their, their demand keeps growing every year. So they're going to want to have the same margin of stockpiles, which means bigger stockpiles each year. What's certainly true, Lisa, is that uh, the situation with Iran and the situation with Russia has given the, the ability as the main buyer of crude from those countries, a country that many, many places in the world won't buy from has given the chance to buy a lot of oil at discounted prices. Um, and I think it's certainly true to say that Iran's growth in supply has been one of the most important factors in the oil market this year. And China has taken advantage of that. But we won't see similar growth in Iranian crude next year. How much does that really pit Xi Jinping against President Biden when it comes to their meeting on Wednesday? The idea uh, that Iran not being part of the Western world and, and OPEC plus, as well as Russia also being an outcast, has benefited China tremendously from an oil purchase price standpoint. But I think that the U.S., at least in private, would acknowledge that it's benefited them. When we think about uh, the sanctions regimes, what's clear is that the oil has kept flowing, and I suspect Washington wanted to keep the uh, oil flowing. And the last thing that the U.S. is going to want into next year is a spike in oil prices. Um, and if that means that China buys Iranian oil, if that means China buys Russian oil, I think the U.S. is probably OK for that. One interesting thing to note, after events in uh, Israel at the beginning of October, a lot of people expected the U.S. to clamp down on Iranian uh, oil exports um, because of their links with Hamas. Now, that hasn't happened, and I think that's probably one of the reasons why some of the bite has gone out of the oil price, why we've seen this uh, fall off in prices, is because the U.S. has shown, so far at least, little inclination to clamp down on the exports of uh, oil from China, uh, sorry, from Iran, rather. Um, and so that oil okay. continues to flow. So I think China and the U.S. is broadly aligned on the oil market. They're the two biggest consumers of oil. They both have inflation concerns, both have domestic constituencies. Uh, I think it's one area where they could probably reach a fair amount of agreement. What about the rest of the Pacific Rim? I've always studied Indonesia as sort of a hugely ambiguous oil export, oil import as well. As we have this meeting in San Francisco, how will the Pacific Rim watch it in terms of energy? Well, I think they're all pretty much in the same place. The big importers uh, outside China are India and Japan, Korea and Indonesia. It stays as an oil exporter a long, long gone, uh, Tom. It's now a big um, oil importer, despite having a sizable uh, domestic industry to some extent, but its demand is just far outstripping that. They all uh, rely on energy imports. They all rely on the Middle East to supply the bulk of those imports. And I think that they will agree with the Chinese that they would like um, oil prices to be relatively subdued and they can't afford to see, uh, given the fragility in their economies, oil go far above $100 a barrel. This is not the move in crude we expected after the tragic events of early October, that terrorist attack on Israel, down something like 11% on crude since then. Will, thank you, sir. Will Kennedy of Bloomberg on the latest. That move in crude, at least, is just totally unexpected. That second week of October, we were talking still about triple-digit crude and here we are in the low 80s on Brent and in the 70s on WTI. Why? I don't have a clear answer on why. Is it because of a lack of demand or is it because of maybe the fact that the U.S. is producing a record amount of oil or is this something else? I mean, honestly, is this just speculation as Saudi Arabia came out and said? I was day? weaned on this off of the Deutsche Bank Excel spreadsheets of Adam Siminski, Paul Sankey and team. And the answer is to your really important question on why the, what's called Marshallian macroeconomics, the supply and demand dynamics around the equilibrium point of oil is like nothing else in the world. It's teens, weens, micro, small, and as Will Kennedy nailed to us moments ago, yeah, it's about weak demand, but also at the same time supply came on, as he mentions, Iran, and that's where you get the shocks. Right now, you've got to believe it's a partial differential of both. Yeah. I'm going to go with it's about weak demand. So we framed this massive week ahead. <clears throat> I'm not sure what's more important, but I'll tell you what I'm interested in, the retailers. We start to see jobless claims start to climb, just start to push I, out a little bit yeah, higher. I think you're right on Unemployment this. start to climb a little bit higher. What are the retailers seeing in a business every single day going into year end? 
And we've got retail sales together anyway, so that's kind of a feature for yeah. me, Tom. Home Depot, see, they need to hire some more people. 471,600 yeah. work at the Orange Box. That's in Walmart. You know. We're talking serious numbers. Coming up shortly, Thomas Kennedy of JP Morgan Private Bank on fixed income. Your bond market, stable, quiet this morning. It's a Kennedy show. For once, the 10 year <clears throat> down just a single basis point. Your yield, 464. I think actually this disinflation is pretty deeply embedded now. Take the cash, but be ready to lean into equities. Get your shopping list ready to rebalance over the first half, maybe the first quarter of 2024. There's certainly no reason not to own growth. People do expect some deceleration and potentially bigger <clears throat> one than this currently priced in. I don't think we're done with the volatility, Lisa. <laughs> I think it's here to stay for a while. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Bloomberg Surveillance, Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramitz, and Tom Keen. A busy week ahead on radio and television. We'll bring it all to you. CPI, retail sales, a presidential meeting in San Francisco uh, with China. And John, oh, to have the Bramo cam on as we launch from the 7 a.m. hour over to 8 o'clock. It's, a, it's a, a New York City tradition. Bramo pricing Christmas trees. Bramo is pricing Christmas trees. Apparently they've gone up in price. She is shocked. Lisa reckons they've doubled. They've doubled. <clears throat> they've doubled. And this they've is doubled. a cumulative inflation, which we talked about last week. And I'm sorry, it's the underpinning of the CPI report. We're going to go month over month, year over year. Our entire radio and TV audience is saying baloney. They don't care. It's the Bramo Christmas price. It's 2019 versus <clears throat> now. That's what they care. The baseline yeah. is pre-pandemic to now. I agree. It's not month on month. Yeah. It's not annualized over the last three months. It's not year over year. It is 2019 versus now. And Tom, it's a one-two punch this week. So retail sales on Wednesday, yeah. CPI on Tuesday, and I'm with you. That's my focus too. How much more sensitive is right. this consumer becoming? What do you see in the retail earnings this week? Team coverage, our Bloomberg Christmas correspondent, Lisa <laughs> Here we go. joining us. What did you observe at Whole Paycheck? Okay, look. I love this time of year because I love the smell of the pine trees. And oh, I love when okay. they go up and I always pass them and I like watching this? through this corridor <laughs> of trees. And here. it was so $69 at the local Whole Foods or Whole Paycheck, as you call it. A couple of years ago, it was $40. And then, you know, a year earlier, 35 You just right. see it in a new way that you hadn't seen it before. And, and I'm going to go to the headline of the weekend in terms of outlooks always laying as Dr. Ed Yardeni with decades of experience. He rocked launch is up 22% on his SPX call for next year. And this is the two Americas, John, that we've got that Lisa identifies. We have two Americas prospering, worried about the stock market, worrying about the price of the trip to Paris. And there's another America flat on their back. And that's the America that showed up in the consumer sentiment numbers out of you, Mitch. On Friday, yeah. consumer sentiment down, inflation expectations. Well, that was a shock. Yeah, was it three point two percent? Those six hundred yeah. people that took that phone call moved <clears> the <throat> dial. I joke, but ultimately, I think that's the broader story in this country right now. That's reflected also in the polls that you see at the moment, with regards to this <clears throat> White House and President Biden yeah. and the job they're doing with this economy. Lisa, I was stunned by the moonshot of the market closing on Friday. What did bonds do in particular? I saw one chart. I think Goldman Sachs of triple B spreads coming into new tights. But what what did did your world do given the melt up that we've seen in 22 stocks out there? In the outlooks for next year, how many people are saying that they're overweight investment grade credit? And actually, if you want to get really excited, go a little bit into high yield. You see <coughs> spreads contracting because what this is, is immaculate disinflation, a slowdown, cuts the, to the Fed funds rate that are just generally going to be positive for the credit sphere. I'm looking at the real yield. I haven't quoted it yet today, John. 2.32%, middle in between that peak angst of 2.50%. Down we came. We came back a little bit on the 10 year real yield. Today. Equities look like this. If you are just joining us, we're pulling back by 0.2%, just a bit softer after two weeks of gains on the SP 500. Yield's not doing much. Let's call it down a basis point on a 10 year, 464.39. Bramo, you can get like these pine needle candles if you'd like one. I'll get you one for Christmas. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I actually don't like the shedding. 
No, you can get a candle. Yeah, yeah. That but just candle smells just like, like smells just, like the pine. Get, but is it authentic the, the or is it like scent, cloying? The scent of the season. Like the no, cinnamon okay, okay. cloyingness, I can't take get that. An expensive one. Okay. All right, the scent Aww. of the season. Oh, that's right? so sweet. Okay. We'll, we'll hook Bramo up. That's good. Guys, all right? you don't have to worry about the scent when you got vet bill in kennel field yeah, up the there. Tree. <laughs> <laughs> it's the Adding same. their own scent. What we do here is we have smart guests like Will Kennedy just joining us at Queen Victoria Street in London on oil, and now joining us his compatriot in Irish crime, Thomas Kennedy joins the chief investment strategist at J.P. Morgan. One Kennedy to another, and you linked it when you sat down, and you looked at Will Kennedy's world and says, when the price of oil moves, you see in Chase's charge card juggernaut reaction. What do you observe as oil comes down? Yeah, we saw a change in the way the consumer was reacting to higher oil prices around August, September area in our Chase credit card data. Remember, we're banking about 20% of America. And what we saw there was... Oh, nice plug. You nailed that early when, on. <laughs> when gasoline prices rose, you actually saw discretionary spending go down. Now, Tom, you might be saying, well, of course you're going to see that, right? Prior to August and September, in the post-COVID era, right. we did not see that relationship. It suggests <clears throat> the excess savings in America might actually be depleting after how many quarters of negotiating on it. Um, right. And then when we really dig into the, the accounts of these folks, and we do it in an anonymous, anonymous fashion, about half of America looks like they're out of excess yeah, savings. If you're, if you're missing words up, it's okay. You're sitting on the side of the table where we do that routinely. I, I, you know, I'm looking, Tom Kennedy, at, at the polarity between Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs today. You need the leadership of Bruce Kasdan and Michael Faroli to give you an economic backdrop. What's your economic backdrop that forms your outlook call this year? Yeah, we're expecting a growth slowdown pretty much like the rest of Wall Street at this point. And it is relatively simple and intuitive. You have the cost of capital above expected revenue in this economy. And if you think about America as one big business, it's very odd to see the cost of capital to be above expected GDP. It should force investors to say, maybe I'll just save instead of borrow money and invest in my business. We've seen this four or five times in the last 40 years. Just about every time you see a growth slowdown, Tom. So we should expect that to happen. The question becomes, what's the scenarios where it doesn't happen? And in those scenarios, you have one where either the consumer is much more resilient and they have access to borrowing and you're going to see growth come higher or something breaks in the meantime. Those are pretty dynamic and polarizing uh, outcomes in the future. Everything you set up until then, though, said by the 10 year, go along the curve, lock in some of this yield. Is that right? Yeah, I think it has to be. John, you have at this point a municipal bond that is giving you equity-like yields. And for the first time in 20 years, you, it is actually competing with the earnings yield on the S&P 500. For my clients that are gathering wealth for generations, I can show them something that has near zero default risk and you can get equity-like yields. Is there risk to that? Of course there is. But that's a dynamic that they haven't seen in two decades, and now I can start to reposition some of their portfolio. And they say, Thomas, I'm nervous. I'm seeing yields all over the place. Are they reluctant to buy? even at these rates, even after you tell that story? Is there a reluctance still to buy it? In our, in our data for the last 12 months, this has been the trade that people have been excited about and can get invested in. That doesn't mean it's not without angst. When we saw a five-year tax-free yield show up two weeks ago, that dynamic changed. 5% tax-free. For people in New York City where we're sitting, guys, you've got to buy a taxable bond above 10% to get an equal return. So it's, the behavioral experience for them did change there. Uh, I think it, as a market prognosticator makes you say, well, how high can rates really go before we're going to see that crowding out effect of, of um, high yields? One of the mysteries of this year has been what the main driving force in yields has been. Is it the economy? Is it inflation? Yeah. Is it the politics or the fiscal backdrop? This is going to be a really interesting test. What do you think is going to be most important with yeah. respect to market volatility of all the things that are going to happen this week? The Fed, expected outlook for the Fed. You can explain more than three quarters of all the movement in rates just from those two things, where the Fed is and where you expect them to be in a year's time. In the last couple of months, you have seen, um, I would call it supply of treasuries become a little bit more of a factor, but not, not dominant at this point, Lisa. So as we look ahead, what's going to matter? The slowdown, how big of a slowdown is it? And importantly, what will the Fed's reaction function be? You said that half of America's are, uh, half of America is pretty much out of savings, uh, based on your data. Yeah. 
which half, right? I mean, is this the half that has been spending more aggressively and will continue to uh, if they had the money? Or is this a half uh, that is particular in the economy, right? I mean, we're talking about the two Americas. We've got a lot of Americas and they're moving at different speeds. Yeah. The two Americas theme really resonates <laughs> for me. But the folks that are out of excess savings are the bottom half of America. And those are traditionally the ones that don't have excess savings. So now they have a decision to make. They can either slow consumption or try to turn to their credit card at a time when credit card rates are historically punitive, even when you normalize them for, for uh, where interest rates are or base rates from the Fed. So I think the, the slowdown metrics make sense when your highest marginal propensity mm -hmm. to consume folks are running out of their excess savings. Really sharp article this weekend of the millions of Americans that don't own Apple, they don't own Nvidia, Microsoft, yeah. they missed the boat and they got a 201K. They walk into JP Morgan Chase this morning with a disastrous portfolio, they're miserable. How do you approach the active versus passive retirement debate? I think at, at this point in the cycle, Tom, active is gonna make the most sense in that when you're looking at a passive allocation, even to the equity market, the haves and have nots are there. On the one hand, you have, say, tech in the equity market that has gone through its optimization of its balance sheet. Layoffs in the tech sector have been big in the last 12 months. CapEx is now getting turned back on around AI, and the monetization phase is not going to be that long. Microsoft, as an example, 3% of their revenues are coming from AI already. Meanwhile, you move to small and mid caps, and these are the most interest rate sensitive sectors, and they have debt to EBITDA two to five times. They are going to feel this pain more than uh, than big tech. So in the equity market, as an example, active management, I think, makes sense. As a headline, early cycles when you rotate back to, to more passive ideas. And that's not where we are right now, Tom, in the minds of many. Late cycle is where people think we are right now. I think it's, it's, it's a model. And I, I'm really fascinated by the outlooks. I mean, Tom Kennedy's going to put together a 34-page outlook. I have a rule. I read the first seven. Hey, Tom, it must drive you nuts. Pages. This time of the year, where it's difficult to sort of get beyond mm -hmm. next week, to put something out for the next 12 months, how hard is that? Um, I think it's difficult when you're trying to do it at the end of a cycle. The, the Fed has just done the most aggressive rate hiking cycle we've seen. And where are you? Are you in the muddle through? Are you in the late cycle? Are you in the end cycle? That's the hardest part. But to be able to turn to, to your client and say to them, I can show you equity-like yields in fixed income, I, it's a way to buy some time and get some, some good yield in a portfolio. Pro tip. More charts. That's the, that's the answer. You just fit it with charts. Pro tip. David Malpass at Bear Stearns years ago. When in doubt, add a chart. I saw that from David Costin over at Goldman this morning. I was going through his outlook. It was just full of charts and tables. Uh, uh, Thomas, this was great. It's good to see you. Tom Kennedy there of J.P. Morgan Thank Private you, Bank. Looking to add a little bit really of yield, good. lock in that yield at the longer end of the yield curve. If you're just joining us, welcome to the program. Your S&P 500 shaping up as follows. We are negative here by 0.2%. <coughs> Yields are a little bit lower, but let's call it a basis point, 464.39. No drama this morning. Maybe the drama is going to build through the week. CPI coming tomorrow. Retail sales data on Wednesday. PPI data as well. Retailers reporting earnings. Tons. Walmart, Home Depot. It's, it's that time of the year, Tom, where we get those retailers going into year end. They're always important, but combined with the economic data today, this is this weak demand theory. And I mean, I have a guesstimate. I, I'm completely unqualified to guess about Home Depot or that, but... You know, they've been resilient over the decades, but now what? You know, after the pandemic, it's a mystery. I cannot wait till the Walmart earnings call. I mean, to me, yeah. this will be one of the greatest litmus tests yeah. of the American consumer. If you think about it, when you walk in, do you get the Nerf gun for the kid that just happens to be there that they ask for, or do you just keep on walking by and stick with laundry detergent? I mean, this is sort of the questions that they see in a collective way people are making. Is that what they want this year, the Nerf gun? They have one that's so irritating. <clears throat> they want and they, a new one. They run around the house shooting each other with it. I'm screaming at them, please stop it. We just are digressing I a lot. I sense this was personal. I <laughs> sense this is personal. No, no, no one with the grandchildren visiting would get the <laughs> most expensive kitchen. <laughs> I, saw, I went past TK <laughs> it's Turtle I, I earlier. I saw this too. On the Bloomberg. Ridiculous. He likes to play up, you know, it's got charts and yeah. bright flashy lights. <laughs> Differential oh, equations. Amazon this morning. He was on Amazon this morning, morning buying a mini kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> I got, I got the little, I got the little baby. They're like cuisinart, but they're Italian from the mountains. Nice dishes <laughs> and the fake fruit and, and Do you know all what that. What's got me for Christmas? What? A plastic pink tea set <laughs> from Amazon. 
<laughs> I don't for even children. know what to make for children. of that. Yeah, it was, it was like to get our tea or British? whatever. It was British. You had tea. You have tea. No tea. one knows tea. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. In the next hour on Bloomberg TV, Peter Chair of Academy Securities is going to weigh in on the bond market. Cameron Dawson, Tony Despirito, all of that and more. This is Bloomberg. This year has been more of a pivot to some of the wide body orders. So we saw a strong narrow body order. Uh, no doubt the world's on fire in terms of travels back. It's a resilient industry. And remember, it's an industry still recovering. We think the resilience of this long-term demand is there. And that's explaining this uh, need for airlines to get ahead and get their order book in place. Stan Deal, Chief Executive Officer of Boeing Commercial Airplanes. We talked about this before. Big, big order today, $52 billion at the Dubai Air Show. Really interesting, and it talks about the expansion of international uh, travel. This is not the Dubai we've all landed at any number of times, but moving towards Abu Dhabi, they're building an entire new airport there where they really have two uh, international efforts. Uh, Lisa Bramwitz and Tom King, John Farrell preparing out to 9 a.m. as well. Claudia Sam will be with us here uh, in a bit. Really looking forward to the discussion on the American economy. Guy Johnson is expert at the development of jets, the crafts that we fly every day. And he knows that Christian Scherer bleeds Airbus. Scherer grew up in Toulouse, France. He's been part of Airbus way, way back for many, many years. And he is now the CCO of the great European airplane builder. Guy Johnson in Dubai. Guy, good morning. Good morning, Tom Keane. All good evening. The sun's setting on day one of the Dubai Air Show. And as you say, it has been a big one. We've seen some significant orders, some promise of even more still to come. And as you say, the wide body market feels like it is back. Over the last few years, this, this has been all about narrow bodies. The recovery out of the pandemic driven by the narrow bodies. Now it's the big workhorses of the sky. Their time to shine. Let's talk to Christian Scherer, as you say, the Chief Commercial Officer at Airbus. If you want to know what's happening in this industry, he is the guy to talk to. Christian, nice to see you. Thanks for making some time for us. Look, the, the world at the moment feels like we've got a lot of geopolitical tension. We've got a lot of uncertainty. We've got a lot of economic uncertainty as well. Rates have been jacked up. Economies are slowing down. Yet it doesn't feel like it at this show. Huge orders across the piece in terms of what we're seeing from airlines from around the world. Why the disconnect? I wouldn't say it's a disconnect. You know, an order at an air show is, uh, I wouldn't say anecdotal, but it's, it's being uh, very much highlighted because it's an air show. Uh, you will, will have seen that this year alone there have been lots of orders, uh, in particular with, with us at Airbus, well before the air show, during the air show, yeah. there'll be orders after the air show. So it isn't like a, uh, an incredible peak all of a sudden. It's part of a phenomenon. The air but show it's been is building an event. for a while, though. It, this, it has. this is a kind of moment in time when you can take stock. As you say, like you're about to, to sign a very large order with Turkish Airlines, a huge order. A lot of narrow bodies in there, but a lot of wide bodies as well. This feels like a moment in time just to reflect on what is happening. And it feels like demand from the customer is still very strong. Demand within the industry is very strong. They've, they've watched what happens with the narrow bodies and the, they've sold out. Now these guys want to make sure that they've got their slots. Like, what is driving this demand? What gives the industry this confidence? Uh, probably uh, the fact, uh, Guy, that we're uh, seemingly in an undersupply situation again. So there's a lot of jockeying for delivery positions. You don't want to miss the train. Uh, just a few years ago in the midst of the pandemic, uh, remember, we manufacturers were asked to slash our production by roughly 50%. Uh, so it takes time. There's a lot of industrial inertia to rebuild an industrial system that's capable of producing large numbers of wide body airplanes. And so they don't come in large numbers. So yep. you don't want to miss the train. You, you study the numbers very carefully. If I, if I look at what is happening with discretionary spend at the moment, I listen to LVMH or Richemont or Diageo. They're talking about that, dis, that sort of high-end discretionary spend beginning to roll over. Mm. Do you think that happens in aviation or do you think the lesson from the pandemic is, you know what, I won't have the cognac, I won't have the Cartier watch, but I will have the airfare? I think the latter is true. I think uh, an air trip is no longer a luxury 
per se. It is part of discretionary consumer spending. It's probably a... At the, uh, the top of the list? It, I would think that the recent behavior that we've seen beyond the obvious phenomenon of pent-up demand coming loose after the pandemic, yeah. I believe that the consumer will tend to go enjoy him, her, himself, yeah. herself, visit, visit, uh, friends, family, before they buy an expensive watch. In terms of kind of what happens next, do you see this demand being sustainable? Do you, like you talk about the fact that this, the air show shouldn't just be how we perceive what's going on. You see this as being a sustainable story now. You think white body demand is back where in the cycle do you think we are? I'm not sure we can talk about cycles as much as we used to anymore. Yeah. So I do believe fundamentally it's sustainable. Our studies are telling us that we will see continued growth in air travel, including in wide body air travel, yeah. a little bit less perhaps than before the pandemic um, or irrespective of the pandemic because of the inflationary pressures, yeah. increases in fuel prices, etc., etc. You mentioned it. So we, but we do see sustained demand, including on intercontinental travel. And we do see on the large aircraft where fuel burn in particular and technology plays the biggest part, increased demand to replace old yeah. airplanes. So there's more replacement in the years ahead than there was before. You talk about inflation. What are you building into these contracts? You're selling airplanes five, 10 years down the road. Inflation is running hot right now. How are you building that into your contracts? How much are you building into that contract? How important when you sign a contract is that escalation clause? That's a really good question. And that is a subject of finding the right balance of how you share that risk of inflation with the customer, the airline that is making a purchase decision many years in advance. Typically, uh, Guy, what we do is we index our pricing on indices of material costs and labor costs. Those are U.S. industries. Those are the most mature indices yep. that, uh, that exist in this industry. So we index that. And then if it's a discussion, you know, depending on how far out the airplane is being ordered for, yep. uh, that's a discussion of how we share that risk, that, that inflationary risk with our customer. Are you going to be able to build all these aeroplanes? I spoke to Guillaume a few days ago, the CEO. He, he was talking to me about going from 9 to 10 on the 350 program. If this demand continues, do you have to go 10 to 11, 11 to 12, 12 to 13? And how hard is that? Well, one step at a time. Uh, remember, we're coming from, we were at a rate 10 before yep. the pandemic. We slashed it down. Now we're ramping back up to 10. It's not a trivial thing. Um, Airbus is not necessarily the limiting factor here. It's a huge supply chain that we're yep. pulling with us, and that's the pacing item. Is it conceptually possible that we go further? Yes. In fact, the, uh, the ever optimistic uh, commercial man in me will say, yes, most probably yep. we will. But that is not for today. We have objective 10 per month in yep. our site. That's what we're going to do. And our programs are running very much on time. One final quick question. It's come up a lot today in the conversations that I've been having. The, the Rolls-Royce, new CEO of Tufan, appears to be running the business in a slightly different way. He can clearly add up, he clearly wants to make some money, and that is resetting the relationships within the industry. They're, they are sole supply on the A350. How, as that relationship changes, how does the relationship between Airbus and Rolls-Royce change, Airbus and Emirates change? How does it change the nature of the, uh, of, of the relationship between, between supplier, customer, uh, and ultimate customer? Well, I'd say two things. The first one, the most important is, we're really, really happy with the Rolls-Royce engine on the A350 program and on the A330 as well. But on the A350 program in particular, the XWB engine, I will dare say, is by far the best engine in the sky today. In reliability, in fuel burn, in durability, it's a wonderful engine. Um, so that's point one. Point two, yes, there is a resetting of pricing in the engine business. The fuel burn, the engine guys have developed fabulous machines to lower the fuel burn. That comes at the expense, at some expense on the maintenance side because these engines consume parts quicker. Yep. They consume less fuel, more parts. And that reset is what's happening in the industry, in the engine industry at large, and Rolls-Royce is no exception. It's been great to see you. 
Thank you very much indeed, Christian. Thanks for taking us, Thank uh, taking the time and, have, and hosting Pleasure. us here at Airbus. Tom Keane from the Dubai Air Show. The sun is setting here. Back to you. Guy Johnson, thank you so much. Always uh, interesting. Much more to talk about. I need to tell you the schedule tomorrow at 8.30 a.m. A report on inflation coming up today at 8.30. Claudia Sam, a beautiful day in New York. surveillance. Good morning, everyone. On a Monday, an eventful week coming up. We'll get to the economic data in a moment. The data right now that you need equities, bonds, currencies, commodities, futures negative seven. I'd say a little bit better tape than two hours ago. The VIX crescendos high to a fear level of 15.01. Amy Wu Silverman, Lisa, was brilliant earlier and the oddities is measured by things like the VIX. Yeah, and that basically, if you look under the hood, people are trying to parse. It's not all big tech or not into big tech. It's Microsoft versus Apple. It's really trying to understand the nuances of a market that people are not willing to bet against yet again. Turn to the bond market. I missed this on Friday. 5.05% of the two-year yield. I mean, we, we really vaulted back up to a yield that describes maybe a Fed meeting to come. There's one in December. And we're also right going to get a bunch of, <laughs> if you want to get a gauge of that, <clears throat> check out the Christmas trees. But I am looking right now uh, at the expectation for CPI in about an, uh, 24 hours time. We'll get that. We also get at 11 a.m. We haven't mentioned this because it's more peripheral. The New York Fed's one-year inflation expectations. Do any <clears throat> of these sort of smaller indicators really move the needle in a more material way if they prove to be some sort of outlier? I got lectured once, Lisa, by one Michael McKee, our Bloomberg International Economics and Policy Correspondent here on the secondary and tertiary data. I believe it was the Empire <laughs> Statistic yes. of Buffalo, New York. Lectured Michael McKee, to, to Lisa's smart <laughs> yeah, question, do these secondary inflation guesses, are they something we should pay attention to? Uh, it, it fits in with what the chair and the rest of the Fed say about the weight of all of the evidence. They are watching inflation expectations because inflation expectations are a bedrock of their inflation dynamics uh, system. They feel that if they become unmoored, as it were, that that suggests inflation ahead. So they're watching those. There's some concern about what's happened with Michigan lately. We saw uh, another big jump on Friday in the Michigan inflation expectations Hold numbers. Up. Just quickly, did people actually care? I was actually shocked that people seemed to have a John and Tom response to it, which was they had yeah. the, the highest inflation expectation for five to ten years, going back years, and people just kind of shrugged it off as, eh, they just surveyed yeah, such I, people. Yeah, I think people aren't really putting a lot of credence in Michigan, and I'm not sure why, but there seems to be some oddities in the way people are responding to surveys right now. We see the same on the political side. But the thing about the Michigan numbers is they're up, but are they really <clears throat> telling us you know, where, where people think inflation is going to be at a time when gasoline prices are just falling rapidly and uh, Americans tend to equate gasoline prices with uh, where they think inflation is going to go? You said people are responding to surveys in weird ways. Can you elaborate? Well, a lot of people have been asking about what's going on with the fact that Joe Biden can't catch a break in these surveys. And inflation's going down and growth is high and unemployment is low. And there seems to be a feeling among uh, professional pollsters that what we're seeing is a, a protest vote, in other words. People are saying that they're answering a poll because they know it doesn't matter right now. And they're answering a poll and saying, I don't like things the way they are right now, inflation is still too high, we're not seeing inflation come down, and that won't necessarily be how they feel a year from now. Right. Uh, and anybody who has uh, worked with statistics and polling know that you don't put any weight on what people are saying a year ahead of time, it fills time on TV networks and uh, takes up space in newspapers, but doesn't really right. mean anything. And, and so you're getting this weird uh, public Vox Populi that's in opposition to what logic would tell you. And, and so that's why right. we say there's some weird stuff out there. It's same with the economics. Everybody seems to be saying, my life is great, but the economy overall is bad. 
and that right. doesn't compute. Mike, we talked to Lisa Bramow, it's Bloomberg Christmas correspondent here earlier about the price of Christmas trees, a moonshot at Whole Foods. And, and Mike, I really got to ask I, about I that this your week. importance yeah. of cumulative inflation, the societal emotion I feel every day, which is a three-year lift in prices versus your granular focus tomorrow at 8.30 on month over month. Well, we're looking at month over month because the Fed's looking at month over month. They're wanting to see continued progress being made and find the areas in which it is not to, to see why it is not if, if it doesn't continue going down. The American public are looking at the longer run because they're saying we <clears> came <throat> into the pandemic at these prices for uh, Christmas trees or whatever you want, and now we got to pay these prices. And some things, commodity-based, go up and down in price, but a lot of other things, get the price gets raised and stays that way. We were talking on Friday about how car prices, except for Teslas, what are they never doing go right down. now? What are they doing right now? Car used prices cars. have been going up, but used car prices have been going down dramatically. So that should put some weight on the core uh, CPI tomorrow. Very good. Michael McKee, thanks for that brief. Hugely important data. It's a Tuesday data tomorrow at 8.30. Michael McKee will brief. She has become acclaimed. Claudia Sum was summoned out of Michigan in the Fed a number of years ago with a really, really dry, smart academic paper on government assistance and how to decide wrapped around recession economics. She's literally become a household name. Dr. Sam joins us now, former Fed economist, founder of Sam Consulting. I guess congratulations. The only one, Claudia, had a bigger year than you was Taylor Swift. We expect we'll see you at a Kansas City football game uh, anytime soon. Claudia Sam, I've got to get it out of the way just because of the notoriety. How close are we to recession? We're closer than we were say the middle of this year, we're not in a recession. And that's not just the SOM rule. Look around, the economy is still growing. Now, that's no guarantee that we will be in that place, um, you know, in the, in the coming months. And yet we are not in a danger zone with the labor market. And there's a lot of reasons why we may have seen the unemployment rate come up that could be good reasons, like workers coming back. What's important here, and you have it in your research note to us, and, and Bramo, I think, has really been out front on this, is almost the behavioral impact, think Thaler at Chicago, the behavioral impact of feedback loops. Tell us about what you're working on the new, I'm, I'm selling this, folks, for Claudia. She needs something to do. The new acclaimed SOM feedback loop. What's it look like? Well, this is the logic I mean, the SOM rule is about the unemployment rate rising a relatively small amount. That happens early in recessions. It's been very accurate. The idea behind it comes well before me in that once the unemployment rate starts rising, it keeps going. Because on the demand side, there's this feedback loop. Some people lose their jobs, then they buy less, then those workers lose their jobs, and, and so on and so forth. And that's where it really gets going. What we see right now is not just the demand side, which would be a typical path into a recession. We see this, you know, workers have really come back. We've gone from labor shortages to now some workers that are looking for jobs, right? It's going to take the jobs longer to catch up. That's a good thing. We needed those workers. It's just as with everything else in this economy, it's been messy to line up supply and demand. So now it's in the labor market. How uncomfortable does it make you to say this time is different? Very uncomfortable. Uh, and yet, we could have said many times since the pandemic, this time is different, and very legitimately. You know, I talk about the quote-unquote SOM rule breaking, which is it would trigger, and then we would not go into a recession. Last year, we saw two quarters of declines in GDP growth that has only happened inside of recession since World War II. It happened, and we were not in a recession. So the SOM rule could be next in line to break, and... I mean, I prefer it didn't. I prefer unemployment stay low. But if it did, my base case is we don't go in a recession. Does this mean uh, that right now you see sort of the immaculate disinflation or you see just year over year inflation come down to the Fed's target by later next year without necessarily the Fed doing anything more and even potentially cutting rates like so many Wall Street firms seem to believe? I take issue with the idea or the term of immaculate disinflation. I mean, this is coming out of a pandemic. We know where this is coming from. It's not just like it appeared. And yet, to your point, we've already seen it. 
right? And there are not all the disruptions worked out in the economy. The labor market's a place where we've seen some of like the kind of last momentum. There is more to give in terms of inflation coming down. It's going to be messy. I expect tomorrow not to be a fun day uh, in core inflation. And and there is some of the demand to come out. And we've seen that wage growth has slowed back to something more normal. So everything is rowing in the right direction on inflation. It's just going to be slow and bumpy. Can you draw a distinction, Claudia, between people coming back into the market and the participation rate, which hasn't actually gone up so dramatically, even as we do talk about people coming back into the labor force? When we look at the year as a whole, participation has moved up. That's a very slow moving uh, creature just in terms of the measurement. We've absolutely seen a burst of uh, workers. Women's employment is at an all time high. We have seen a big surge of immigrants in terms of the work visas finally getting processed. So we've had people coming back in. It is there in the data and the labor force participation. And some of these factors are more temporary. And that's part of the jobs being able to catch up. Like we're still adding jobs at a good clip, just not like last year. Uh, Claudia, so it, I don't mean to interrupt, but I think it's really no, important no. into the CPI data tomorrow and retail sales the next day. The Boston Fed as a cottage industry of trying to, this is Michelle Barnes years ago, folks, trying to figure out guessing consumption. Can we actually guess consumption? How do you respond to people talking about, well, this is the credit card data or that? What do the academics like you actually say about gaming 70% of the American economy? Right, so I was one of the lead forecasters on consumer spending at the Federal Reserve for about a decade. So I spent a lot of time trying to forecast right. uh, consumer spending. The big piece, and I've talked about this recently, it's the income. Like if we lose the labor market, we lose consumers because many people spend their paychecks. If we lose consumers, we're done. We're in a recession. So to me, it's like all eyes on the labor market that it keeps right. in the place it is. And household balance sheets are in a place that they have not been in for a very long time, particularly at the bottom. Like, that's really encouraging. Claudia, thank you so much. Claudia Sam, a former Federal Reserve economist as well. Lisa, to me, it's gaming 70 percent of the economy. And I strongly believe that little tidbit you hear there from Dr. Sam, which is an Econ 101, people spend their paycheck. Small matter. Which is the reason why uh, when Tom Kennedy <clears throat> came on and said that they're seeing people out of savings, in the lower half of income, uh, right. income families, then you end up with less discretionary spending. Or, you know, I mean, there's bracket. ambiguities involved here, but I believe it was Honda with a 9% pay raise in, for U.S. labor off of the GM strikes. I mean, if you give people a 9% pay raise, what do they do with it? Right. They and don't buy the triple levers to all cash fund. They spend it. What Claudia was saying there was fascinating to me because everyone hates the phrase, this time is different, and yet, we're kind of hearing that more and more from people who have gotten trained by a very difficult economic cycle with massive uh, pandemic era distortions exactly. that you have been talking a lot about, Tom, and correctly so. I, I think we underplay the pandemic here as far out as we are. We also underplay the data, a little deterioration, futures at negative 13, Standard & Poor's 500 down. Three tenths of a percent. Coming up, we're going to be speaking with Stephen Englander, uh, Standard oh, Chartered good. Bank's global good. head of G10 FX Research. And this <clears throat> comes at a time where there's really a question around the U.S. fiscal picture uh, and how long the dollar will remain the haven bid if people actually start to worry about political dysfunction as we were Monday at <clears throat> 6 p.m. Is that what you said when Moody's <laughs> downgraded or put the U.S. on watch for downgrade from that trip? I, I really wonder that, I mean, I get why they do it. They don't want to roil the markets in that, but. You know, there'd just be something more visible and open to immediate discussion and analysis by doing it. At, you know, pick 10 a.m., whatever. Pick the hour. Of the, why bury it on the Friday afternoon? Well, people had a weekend to digest it. It didn't Fair, seem to be roiling yeah. the market right now when people no. uh, take, take stock of what they're saying because they're basically stating the obvious, which really raises this question this week. What's the most important thing? Is it going to be Walmart earnings and Home Depot? Is it going to be what we get with CPI tomorrow? Or is it going to be... The potential well, for a government shutdown. I'm going to go beyond the consumer report. I was wrong last week on the 30-year auction, but I would suggest that the control group of said retail sales, which folds into Walmart, Home Depot, the control group taking out Guy Johnson in Abu Dhabi, in Dubai rather, taking out, you know, the rest of it as well is, is really 
Key. It is a busy week, to say uh, the least, including two presidents meeting in San Francisco. Anne-Marie Horton will have complete coverage of the Biden G summit. Look for that here. Uh, futures, negative 14. Lisa Bramlitz and Tom Keene, stay with us. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. have been pretty sanguine on the probability of a soft landing for at least a couple of months now. We don't really believe that has changed very much, but we still also believe that the tails of the distribution remain fatter than usual. And we do think that heading right. into 2024, <clears throat> we could get a delayed but harder landing. Sonia Meskin speaking with us last week, head of U.S. Macro at BNY Mellon Investment Management as people coalesce around I think a soft landing. I think it's fair to say that, Tom, that there seems to be a consensus right now heading into 2024. It's early days, but that there's going to be some sort of soft landing with yeah, inflation I, coming down, unemployment not rising too much, and the economy slowing but not tanking. I, I, I strongly agree that soft landing is the consensus, but it's how you get to a soft landing, which I think is so variable. And the distinction this morning, folks, of the Morgan Stanley Goldman Sachs differential or, or separation, I should say, in outlook is Zentner's call for a higher unemployment rate than what we see from Dr. Hatzius. Right now, a bit of softness to the tape uh, in the equity space. Bonds basically range bound, which is uh, sort of unusual, although in the past couple of minutes, 10 year yields did tick up just a bit, three tenths of a percent decline on the S&P. I wanted to take a look at two specific names, Home Depot and Lowe's. Home Depot reporting tomorrow. You mentioned this, Tom, earlier. Lowe's reporting next week. Both of them <coughs> down on the year, not incredibly surprising given where mortgage rates are. Home Depot shares lower by 7.7% year to date, 2.3% decline on lows. What I think is interesting is that they are poised for their first simultaneous declines in full year <coughs> revenue growth since 2010, just to give you a sense of where we are. My sense of where we are, and I don't know what to do with this, and I fully disclosure, I don't own shares, Walmart, present PE on the Bloomberg, 30. How does Walmart have a, th I, I don't get how a store I mean, I get they get operating leverage and they take single-digit revenue growth down to a lovely double-digit EBITDA, but, you know, that's like CFA 101. How does that equate to a 30 multiple? I just don't get it. We're going to be looking at both the valuation side as well as the <clears throat> fundamental picture, but what you've seen for Walmart is they've been able to adapt to an Amazonification of the world, uh, whereas Home Depot and Lowe's are still very much more tied to the housing right. market. Interesting to see whether they see some of the trends shifting or getting worse since mortgage rates are not going down all that much. Well, we're going to have to see here. The VIX up a stick, 15.12. Um, I've got uh, futures at negative 13. Bond's not giving me much love this morning after the festivities Friday. Critically, American oil, $77.00. At three cents. On a Monday, we need a brief on foreign exchange. And out of his uh, work at Yale University, Stephen Englander has been absolutely definitive over the decades. Global head of G10 FX research at the Standard Charter Bank. I love in your research report, Stephen Englander, you can't figure out what to do because of the unreliability of the U.S. dollar. Discuss. Well, look, I, I think the dollar is been a very macro trade and it's reflecting the uncertainty about where interest rates are going and where the uh, sentiment is going. And I, I think in particular, you know, w when we talk about the dollar smile with, you know, the idea that the dollar can rise when things are very good or, or when, <coughs> when, when things are, are quite bad, um, I think right now the market isn't sure where we are on that smile. You, you know, you look at moments when equities seem right. very weak and that would suggest a stronger dollar. Other times it, it looks like um, a weaker economy suggests boom time and everybody's buying. Uh, Catherine Mann, now at the Bank of England and others, would talk about the codependency of China and the U.S. on flows of money, of trade. Lisa, you mentioned earlier that net, uh, net whatever net in China has just gone to a negative yeah. for the first time ever. At this Direct summit investment. in San Francisco, Steve Englander, how does dollar dynamics and currency money big flow dynamics play into the summit and the tension? Well, you know, I, I think China is still trying to get the U.S. to relax some of the um, 
you know, what they consider to be unneeded uh, sort of trade sanctions. I mean, I, I think the ship has sailed on, on, on ships that have military applications, but there's a lot of stuff that's um, got tariffs on it that probably nobody thinks does, ex needs them, except for political reasons. And I think that they're trying to see if there's a way of getting those, um, getting those removed. Um, overall, I'd say that would probably be a, a positive if there were some, you know, for markets, if there was some progress. It's not going to be, you know, a lightning bolt, but it would, on the margin, it would encourage some optimism. Steve, how much do you care about Friday and the potential for a government shutdown? I had to remind myself, oh, the, the, the shutdown, yes, indeed. Uh, look, I, we don't think it's going to happen. Uh, you know, politically, there's no upside for the Republicans if they do it, and, and the signals they're sending is that it's going to be a relatively uh, clean type of extension of, of the continuing resolution. I, um, you know, if they do shut down, I, I you know, I, I think it will have um, a short length and they will figure out some way of trying to get out of it with uh, as much dignity as they can. Well, but I guess that my question is, let's say there is a shutdown. I understand that it might be a remote possibility by a lot of prognosticators. Do you think it'll matter for the dollar and that people will be more reluctant to buy, especially uh, given the fact that we got Moody's warning on Friday? Yeah, look, you know, I, I, I think the market will look past it. They look, you know, uh, Moody's barely registered um, on any kind of scale. And I, I, I think the shutdown, if it's like, you know, you shut down national parks, um, you know, it, it, yeah, it matters a bit, but it's not going to be a big deal. I mean, you know, basically the market's been trading off U.S. yields uh, to a large degree, the FX market, that you don't care if it's real yields, inflation expectations, term premium, if you, if you can get, <clears throat> you know, 10 basis points higher, they buy the dollar. And so I think that that's going to continue at least in the short term, to be um, what's driving the right. market. Steve, your ambigu ambiguity on U.S. dollar, I understand. I still need to have a trade today. You're the great cross-trade uh, 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 analyst. For Standard Charter Bank, what's the most attractive six-month trade right now? Well, you know, if you're looking at six months and if you have deep pockets, I, I think that the you know, Japanese story is shifting quickly. Give me the and, magnitude you know, of that move. Give me the magnitude of the strong yen move we could see. Oh, you know, I'm not, you know, not going to give you a, a number, but I'd say that one thing to keep an eye on is that every uh, central bank that thinks it can gently get inflation to target has woken up one day <clears> and, and discovered it's a way above target and that they have to move much more on monetary policy than they anticipated. So, it, to me, that's kind of the big uh, yen upside that's coming. And, and just within a six-month horizon, it, you know, potentially, I'm not saying it's going to happen, but I think that that uh, could generate a lot of yen strength if, if that were the case. You're not going to give me a number, though. Come on, it's Monday. Nobody's listening. Everybody tunes in tomorrow, Steve Englander. We're at a $151 yen. Give me some form of big figure move here. Uh, I... I, I'm actually not going to do that, but I'll, 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 you know, I, I think it would, I think it would register on the scale. I mean, it's just, it would be, a, you know, I'd say it's a first order FX move, not kind of uh, very yeah, good up today down tomorrow. Always a class act, Steve Englander. Thank you so much to Standard Charter Bank. You see, I struggled with that. I mean, you know, I, I'm being completely rude there, folks, but I've known Steve for decades here with such a respect for his work. But he's saying here, at some point, they blink. And I'm going to make up these numbers. These are not Dr. Englander's numbers. Lisa, it's a $151 yen. And you and I are out shopping, holiday, spring, into the summer. And all of a sudden, it's 132 And how much is this going to come with the nod from the Fed being able to <clears throat> right. cut rates? And then it kind of makes their life a little easier. Uh, just pointed out to us uh, from... Chris in the control room, that the president is going to be welcoming the Vegas Golden Knights to the White oh, House today yeah, to celebrate good. their Stanley Cup victory. How is it that Vegas is the center of all international sports suddenly? It, it, well, it's not suddenly. It's been over the years, and it's been a huge success there to see uh, uh, Vegas go out there with all sorts of heritage, to, you know, the colors, the gold and the black, and 
uh, to the Army in, in West Point. But it's been a huge success for the National Hockey League, and others are trying to mimic that. And, I mean, when does a baseball team slide in? We've got the Formula One. Toto Wolf with us today uh, from Mercedes. Are you, you going to watch that? I mean, are you going to be I up? I have or, to. I have to know, figure out whether they're going to slide all over the 1 road. 1 a.m. Well, on yeah, a Sunday? Obviously, I'll be up. Honestly, though, to this to me, you know, we were asking, why is it that they're doing it in a place at night that's going to be 45 degrees out uh, that's going to be problematic for the tires? Mm -hmm. Chris emails in from Dubuque. Chris, thanks for this insight because of the sports betting. It's that simple. Do you I mean, actually think that's the case? I, I'm not used to it yet, but everybody tells me it's complete, total. Michael Barr is, is adamant with Bloomberg Business of Sports. About it's driving, betting? It's driving it every discussion, including uh, in hockey. Thanks for that email, Chris. Greatly appreciate that uh, this morning. Futures at negative 15. Tomorrow, 8.30, a report on America's inflation. Good morning.